The Spookiest Story Never Told, Part 2, with Marty Garza. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau, and we also have a Lego model of the cube. I love this thing. (laughs) (laughs) It takes pride of place up there on the desk beneath the giant monitor of the cube. Uh, And uh, this week we have a very special episode, Uh, another installation in the ufo series so we are joined by marty garza of ufo episode fame (laughs) welcome back (laughs) yeah welcome marty thanks for being back on the show man nice to be back it's been a while it has been a while it has been a while but uh you know we've we went to egypt right since the last time we did a ufo episode so is that is that uh did the egypt trip have any effect on your views on ufos um not exactly. I mean, I did go there looking for certain details yeah. and found others, but that's a whole, that's, that's for another day. That's, okay. We'll that's talk about a whole that later. Different, said, different he, rabbit hole. We'll get to that later. I get it. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes, yes. <laughs> Classic. This is the, this is part two of our little mini series that, you yeah. know, the spook, spookiest story ever told. Yeah. Um, And this is something I've been working on for the better part. I would say over a year now. Um, and that that's why this one took so long because there's actually, I had to lay it all out. I couldn't just like ride as I went along. Um, and there's a lot of information in this one. As, as you yes. Know, and uh, and uh, just as much of this one will spill over into the next couple. So, <laughs> yeah. And you told me, you were like, don't worry. There's aren't, there aren't difficult names and you're a liar. I read this, and really? I think there are some <laughs> difficult names in here. Maybe you just don't realize it. <laughs> Maybe I think they're difficult, and you don't. I don't know. But we'll Speechify see. Speechify doesn't have any problem reading it to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, maybe maybe the AI is taking over then. I don't know. Um, <laughs> We could get uh, an AI to read this to, Dude, we to could all make of it, us. We could make it read it in Marty's voice. Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah we could all just at half back. speed. <laughs> yeah, at half speed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Marty, cheers. I don't know if you've got a drink or not. Oh, oh he yeah. does. Yeah, all right. Of course. And uh, <clears throat> I have a blueberry beer. It's not a Bud Light, folks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a Miller High Life champagne of beers. Sweet water. Yeah. And I think we ought to just dive right into this <clears throat> because there is a lot of material here. So uh, let's get going. The spookiest right. story never told, part two. And as always, Marty begins with a quote. And we got the watcher, too, by the way. Oh, yeah. Don't forget. Sorry. I'm going to, somebody's going to get really mad. <laughs> If we don't, someone introduce might the get watcher. real mad and yeah. send you a nasty. So email. the watcher has joined us from deep beneath his secret space station in secret outer space. Hey, watcher, thanks for being here, buddy. Oh, he's cursing at <laughs> yeah, us. Yeah, he is swearing at us <laughs> <laughs> in the in the watcher chat. <laughs> no, super glad to be here, guys. Always, always <laughs> love the Marty Sodes. Um, I have never known someone so skilled to navigate a rabbit hole without going off in a thousand tangents yeah. as Marty Garza is. He manages to take a behemoth and follow it in a straight line that makes sense. It, it's an admirable thing. I've tried thousands of times, failed every single time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He does. You just don't see what goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. This is the polished final product. You know, you don't get to see yeah. the, the construction. Um. Okay, so, Spookiest Story Never Told, Part 2. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Carl Gustav Jung. As is so often vital to clear understanding, before we proceed with our spooky story, we must first go back to the beginning to discuss other events which transpired simultaneously with those discussed in Part 1. Quote, 
I was oppressed by thoughts of pain in life, in death, and religious fear. I was swayed by superstitious belief and lived in constant dread of the spirit of evil, of ghosts and ogres and other unholy monsters of the dark. I suffered from a peculiar affliction due to the appearance of images, often accompanied by strong flashes of light, which marred the sight of real objects and interfered with my thought and action. When a word was spoken to me, the image of the object it designated would present itself, present itself vividly to my vision, and sometimes I was quite unable to distinguish whether what I saw was tangible or not. This caused me great discomfort and anxiety. Unquote. Such was the description of a troubled youth growing up in the Austrian Empire in the mid-1800s. These words were written by a 63-year-old man in a six-part autobiography titled My Inventions, published in Electrical Experimenter magazine in 1919, and that man was Nikola Tesla. In his lengthy autobiography, Tesla quite matter-of-factly describes and self-analyzes extraordinary phenomena which frequently intervened at critical junctures throughout his life, and he provides unique first-hand analytical perspectives of such events. An example of this was his description of the recurrent light phenomenon and visions, of which he states, quote, They certainly were not hallucinations, such as are produced in diseased and anguished minds, for in other respects I was normal and composed. In the stillness of night, a vivid picture of the scene would thrust itself before my eyes and persist, despite all my efforts to banish it. Sometimes it would even remain fixed in space, though I pushed my hand through it. I never had any control over the flashes of light to which I have referred. They were, perhaps, my strangest experience and inexplicable. They usually occurred when I found myself in a dangerous or distressing situation, or when I was greatly exhilarated. In some instances, I have seen all the air around me filled with tongues of living flame." Unquote. Tesla's descriptions should sound eerily familiar to regular listeners, as they are very reminiscent of those previously discussed in accounts by Enoch, Ezekiel, John Dee, and even René Schwaller de Lubitz. However, the familiarities do not end there. In his characteristic analytical manner, Tesla goes on to describe the unusual method and ability he developed as a result of this phenomenon. He states, quote, To free myself of these tormenting appearances, I tried to concentrate my mind on something else I had seen. And in this way, I often, I would often obtain temporary relief. But in order to get it, I had to conjure continuously new images. It was not long before I found that I had exhausted all of those at my command. My reel had run out, as it were, because I had seen little of the world, only objects in my home and the immediate surroundings. As I performed these mental operations for the second or third time in order to chase the appearances from my vision— the remedy gradually lost all its force. Then I instinctively commenced to make excursions beyond the limits of the small world of which I had knowledge, and I saw new scenes. These were at first very blurred and indistinct and would flit away when I tried to concentrate my attention upon them. But by and by I succeeded in fixing them. They gained in strength and distinctness and finally assumed the concreteness of real things. I soon discovered that my best comfort was attained if I simply went on in my vision farther and farther, gaining new or getting new impressions all the time. And so I began to travel, of course, in my mind. Every night and sometimes during the day, when alone, I would start on my journeys, see new places, cities and countries, live there, meet people and make friendships and acquaintances, and, however unbelievable, it is a fact that they were just as dear to me as those in actual life and not a bit less intense in their manifestations." Unquote. Here again, these words may easily be interpreted as describing a recurrent ability to observe and to obtain knowledge of things for which there is seemingly no logical explanation. And, as we have also learned from various similar accounts, the experiencer ultimately uses that information for the development of technological advancement. Tesla states, quote, This I did constantly until I was about 17 when my thoughts turned seriously to invention. Then I observed, to my delight, that I could visualize with the greatest facility. I needed no models, drawings, or experiments. I could picture them all as real in my mind. 
Thus, I have been led unconsciously to evolve what I consider a new method of materializing inventive concepts and ideas, which is radically opposite to the purely experimental, unquote. Marty, do you think he's like, it seems like he's describing a kind, like he's almost teaching himself some kind of projection? Is that what it sounds like? Like it's like a type of OBE or astral projection that he's doing it and he's doing it to fight yes. off these phenomena? Yeah. Like a defensive so, mechanism. I mean, there could be different interpretations, and mm. this will be, uh, uh, you know, we'll dive into that a little bit as we get further into this. Yeah. But this could be interpreted a couple of different ways. One is, yes, some form of outer out of body experience, or traveling traveling clairvoyance. Or yeah, the yeah. Many many names that that uh, you, that are used are to describe this type of phenomenon. Or he could be getting information from some other source. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's like, you know, it'd be interesting if he he says he met people and went to cities and stuff. Like, could he be bilocating? That would be also interesting. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, where's that kid that used to come around here? <clears throat> yep. Okay. One could logically question whether the phenomena described by Tesla were real or illusory. Although it is hard to argue against the tangible results, perhaps evidence of the physical nature of the light phenomena may be found in the following account. Quote, While in Paris in 1883, a prominent French manufacturer sent me an invitation to a shooting expedition, which I accepted. On my return to the city that night, I felt a positive sensation that my brain had caught fire. I saw a light as though a small sun was located in it, and I passed the whole night applying cold compressions to my tortured head. Finally, the flashes diminished in frequency and force, but it took more than three weeks before they wholly subsided." Unquote. This passage appears to suggest physical effects, much like those described by numerous individuals who claimed to have encountered similar luminous phenomena, such as those recounted in the Book of Abramelin. And not the least of which are the accounts of Jack's, Jack Parsons and the physical effects suffered by an individual named Moses. At several points throughout the Brothers of the Serpent's UFO series, we have discussed personal accounts of information transfer, typically referred to as downloads. Jack Parsons, Charles Towns, John Nash, Ray Hernandez, Timothy Taylor, and many others all expressed a sense of suddenly acquiring knowledge best described simply as knowing. However, as of yet, we have only heard vague descriptions of the experience. Interestingly, in his autobiography, Tesla provides us with an analytical description of the process which he experienced. Quote, These luminous phenomena still manifest themselves from time to time, as when a new idea opening up possibilities strikes me, but they are no longer exciting, being of relatively small intensity. When I close my eyes, I invariably observe, first, a background of very dark and uniform blue, not unlike the sky on a clear but starless night. In a few seconds, this field becomes animated with innumerable scintillating flakes of green, arranged in several layers and advancing toward me. Then there appears, to the right, a beautiful pattern of two systems of parallel and closely spaced lines at right angles to one another, in all sorts of colors with yellow, green, and gold predominating. Immediately thereafter, the lines grow brighter, and the whole is thickly sprinkled with dots of twinkling light. This picture moves slowly across the field of vision, and in about ten seconds vanishes to the left, leaving behind a ground of rather unpleasant and inert gray which quickly gives way to a billowy sea of clouds, seemingly trying to mold themselves in living shapes. It is curious that I cannot project a form into this gray until the second phase is reached. Each time, before falling asleep, images of persons or objects flit before my view. When I see them, I know that I am about to lose consciousness. If they are absent and refuse to come, it means a sleepless night. Unquote. Some of that sounds like DMT. Right. The color patterns and the way they flash across and the, the you know, it's very interesting. <clears throat> right, but <clears throat> there may be parallels there. Yeah, absolutely. So curiously, it should be noted that Tesla, at least up to this stage in his life, was quite skeptical of parapsychology. He downplayed the more fantastical aspects of his experiences, 
instead analyzing them uh, uh, mechanistically as part of the natural world. However, there remained subtle hints of doubt in his writings, such as, quote, After finishing the studies at the Polytechnic Institute and University, I had a complete nervous breakdown, and while the malady lasted, I observed many phenomena, strange and unbelievable, unquote. There was yet another curious aspect of the odd phenomena surrounding tes Tesla's life, which is also familiar to the podcast and, again, raises questions about its fundamental nature. At critical points in his life, Tesla inadvertently found himself in life-threatening situations, twice involving water. In each of these instances, when reaching the point of surrender, the light phenomenon would again present itself, providing him with a means of survival. One such incident occurred while swimming with friends at the age of 14. Young Tesla dove under a metal structure and suddenly found himself trapped and unable to reach the surface. Of the incident, he states, quote, At that moment, when my situation seemed absolutely hopeless, I experienced one of those flashes of light and the structure above me appeared before my vision. I either discerned or guessed that there was a little space between the surface of the water and the boards resting on the beams, and, with consciousness nearly gone, I floated up, pressed my mouth close to the planks, and managed to inhale a little air, having completely lost the sense of direction, but finally succeeding in getting out of the trap when my friends had already given me up and were fishing for my body." Unquote. Two years later, at the age of 16, Tesla again found himself in yet a greater predicament, this time while swimming in a river alone. He dove into the water and quickly found himself carried off by the rushing current towards a fall. Frantically, he was able to grab a hold of a wall as water rushed over his head. However, this served as little reprieve as he was being crushed by the pressure of the rushing water. He recounts, quote, Just as I was about to let go to be dashed against the rocks below, I saw in a flash of light a familiar diagram illustrating the hydraulic principle that the pressure of a fluid in motion is proportionate to the area exposed, and automatically I turned on my left side. As if by magic, the pre pressure was reduced and I found it comparatively easy in that position to resist the force of the stream, unquote. Once in this position, he was then able to extricate himself from this life-threatening predicament. Despite all of his extraordinary experiences, Tesla still clung to a mechanistic interpretation. Perhaps it was this perspective that inspired him to pursue his future objectives. In this regard, he concludes, quote, This mental activity at first involuntary under the pressure of illness and suffering, gradually became second nature and led me to finally recognize that I was but an automaton devoid of free will and thought and action and merely responsive to the forces of the environment. Our bodies are of such complexity of structure, the motions we perform are so numerous and involved, and the external impressions on our sense organs to such a degree delicate and elusive that it is hard for the average person to grasp this fact." Unquote. Irrespective of his personal interpretation, Nikola Tesla seemed seemingly possessed a form of clairvoyance or supernatural foresight, which was quite apparent through his numerous inventions and over 278 global patents. However, this was also true of his predictive and precognitive statements. An excellent example of this may be found in the following quote, which he wrote in an article subtitled The Art of Teleautomatics for the October 1919 issue of Electrical Experimenter magazine. Quote, As stated on a previous occasion, when I was a student at college, I conceived a flying machine quite unlike the present ones. The underlying principle was sound, but it could not be carried into practice for want of a prime mover of sufficiently great activity. In recent years, I have successfully solved this problem and am now planning aerial machines devoid of sustaining planes, ailerons, propellers, and other external attachments which will be capable of immense speeds and are very likely to furnish powerful arguments for peace in the near future. Such a machine, sustained and propelled entirely by reaction, is to be controlled either mechanically or by wireless energy. By installing proper plants, it will be practicable to project a missile, a missile of this kind into the air and drop it almost on the very spot designated, which may be thousands of miles away. But we are not going to stop at this. Tell Automata will be ultimately produced, capable of acting as if possessed of their own intelligence, and their advent will create a revolution." Unquote. In this phrase, 
tel- Tesla predicted the creation of aerial craft without the need for control surfaces, utilizing wireless energy for propul- propulsion, pr- possessing the ability to launch precision guided munitions to exact locations from thousands of miles away, which would all be guided by artificial intelligence. He also recognized that said development would mark the dawn of a new era. In short, he was describing a UCAV, or Unmanned Combat Aerial Vehicle, more commonly known as a military drone. Except that we're not powering them with <laughs> wireless power. They're... Right. It's not wireless right. power, and they do have control surfaces, usually. And keep in mind that, you know, we have to keep you know, context on this. Um, he wrote this In 18... shortly, after, yeah. shortly after the Wright brothers first right. flew. Yeah, 1919. Right. Yeah, that's right. The Wright brothers. Yeah, so he was a far-seeing person. Very far. Potentially more, uh, potentially yet more interesting accompanying this statement was a fantastical illustration of a cigar-shaped craft with peculiar lighted panels at the nose and portholes running along the side. The caption below the illustration referred to the craft as a self-propelled aerial tell automaton or automaton. Nice. <laughs> that is that extraordinarily is, impressive. Yeah, that is. Wow. Man. How that? this is not more well known. I had never seen this before my research. Wow. That, when I saw that, I about fell out of my chair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, you think man. he's he had seen one of these? He saw this in a flash in his head, right? Like he basically had this. That's how these visions would come to him. I guess. Yeah, he had this idea. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in you know he his this typical Tesla vagueness, uh, where he was like, I conceived this machine in college, right? But the underlying and the underlying principle was sound, but could not be carried into practice because he didn't have a quote unquote prime mover of sufficiently great activity, whatever that means. But then he was like, but I solved that problem. <laughs> <laughs> right? He doesn't say anything about it else about it. Okay, you solved it. What it what does yeah. that mean? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, could okay. mean a lot of things. Yes, it could. You know, you have to look at this from when a, was he writing a historical this? perspective. 1919. Like in his in his older age? Uh yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I believe he was in the So 60s, I mean right? if it was powered wirelessly and he had conceived it in college. He hadn't quite solved the problem of wireless power yet. Well, it's well, it seems to, that he's saying. I'm that, just suggesting that might be what that could be it. But this seems to be what he's saying is the reason it couldn't be carried into practice is for want of a prime mover of sufficiently great activity. In other words, it needs an engine. Energy. Yeah. Right. But I think the next paragraph may has a there may be a connection. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, the gravity research. Okay, so potentially yet more interesting. Accompanying this statement was a fantastical illustration. Okay, we read that. So it should be noted that this article was published only five months after Einstein's discovery during a solar eclipse of the manner in which light rays were bent around the sun due to gravitation, thereby inspiring his quest for a theory unifying gravity and magnetism. Curiously, Tesla's aerial... Tell Automaton shares a striking resemblance to a craft depicted 37 years later in the November 1956 issue of Young Men magazine in connection with an article written by Michael Gladich titled, The G-Engines Are Coming. The article states in part, quote, Gravity research has been supported by Glenn L. Martin Aircraft Company, Convair, Bell Aircraft, Lear Incorporated, Sperry Gyroscope, and several other American aircraft manufacturers who would not spend millions of dollars on science fiction. Lawrence D. Bell, the famous builder of the rocket research planes, says, We're already working with nuclear fuels and equipment to cancel out gravity. And William Lear, the autopilot wizard, is already figuring out gravity control for the weightless craft to come. George S. Trimble, vice president in charge of the G Project at Martin Aircraft Corporation, thinks the job could be done in about the time it took to build the first atom bomb. And another anti-gravity, anti-gravity pioneer, Dudley Clark, president of Clark Electronics Laboratories of Palm Springs, California, believes it will be a matter of a few years to manufacture anti-gravity power packages. But no matter how many years we have to wait, the amazing anti-gravity research is a reality, unquote. 
Adding to this coincidence, Project Blue Book case number 10270 describes an encounter that occurred nearly 10 years after the publication of the G-Engine article on March 26, 1966, near Temple, Oklahoma. A detailed account of this incident is provided in the book Dark Files by Michael Schratt. The incident involved Eddie Laxon, a 56-year-old electronics instructor at nearby Shepard Air Force Base. While driving west on Highway 70 at 5.05 a.m., Laxon observed what he described as a 75-foot-long shiny aluminum craft resting in the middle of the road on what appeared to be retractable landing gear. The craft had no wings or apparent means of propulsion. However, clearly visible was an internally lit canopy at the nose and a porthole and lights along the side. Also visible were the characters TL4768, labeled vertically near the center, and an open doorway with an outwardly pivoting door or ladder combination. Standing below was a man dressed in mil green military fatigues holding a flashlight. The man climbed up into the craft and it rapidly flew away, making a high-pitched sound like that of an electrical arc. Accompanying this account in Dark Files is an artist's rendering created by Tom Bogan, based upon the details stated in the original report. What is depicted is a craft that bears a striking resemblance to the rendering utilized in Gladich's G-Engine article, and that presented 40 years earlier as Tesla's aerial Tell Automaton. <sighs> Man, I remember this case. What a strange case. This is one of the ones that's weird because it's like, it seems like it's just a, you know, a military guy, and he's flying some test vehicle, right? He lands it in the road for some reason. He's checking, making sure the landing gear works properly. Or, I don't know. <laughs> and it is yeah, near this, an Air Force base. <clears throat> this, it, I mean, there are different ways to interpret this. Um, one is it's hard. It's hard not to <laughs> see the consistency between those three mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. um, so is this one way to look at it is, Hmm, this uh, was a technology that may have been secretly developed and was progressing over time. Yeah. The other is, again, does the phenomenon have the ability to pull things out of our reality, things yeah. that are within our realm of understanding and present itself in ways that just conform to that? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like the... The first level is like, okay, it's a it's a military project or maybe just a secret, maybe not even military, just a secret project and the guy's wearing coveralls of some kind. Uh, but then the second level is that that's some kind of screen memory of what really happened. And then the next, uh, another, another possibility is what you stated, that whatever's really going on is able to just pull concepts and then manifest in that way so that it's neither of those things. Right. It's something else entirely. Yeah. And again, we don't know that there's that the connection isn't that the images that Tesla was was, you know, seeing in his mind weren't being inspired by whatever it was. Yeah. That uh, yes, absolutely. Appeared later. You know yeah. what I mean? A lot of different ways. Like to if, the, well, sorry to interrupt you, but if the guy who, so this dude who observed this was a, um, an electronics instructor at the Air Force Base, right? Mm -hmm. So he's inclined to see a military dude in a complex experimental craft. Right. If it had been like a rural farmer like uh, Hernandez or whatever, or not Hernandez, who was the guy that uh, was, he would have seen a tractor or something? Yeah. You uh, know? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jeez. I can't remember his name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> per, 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 his last name's Perez, but um, I can't think. <laughs> yeah. You caught Perez. me off guard. I can't. Yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, yeah. Juan, Juan Perez. Juan, Juan Perez, Perez, yeah. You know, he sees a tractor, uh, some kind of tractor house, right? <laughs> right, exactly. A hut. Yeah, I think he, I think he called it a hut. Yeah. <laughs> a flying hut. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, what, what time we got? Uh, we got uh, a little bit of time. We got some time? I started that a little late, but... Okay. Because this is, we're at a, we're at a, okay, well, we're at we a can, stopping point here. Stop. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll take a break. This is great so far, Marty. I yeah. love the Tesla stuff for sure. Yeah, me too. Okay, we'll be right back, folks.
And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, joined by Marty Garza, having a few beers and uh, talking UFOs and Tesla. Tesla. Interesting angle. Yeah. So far. I wonder where it's leading. I yeah, wonder where, where it's going. It going. Hey, <laughs> we'll talk about we'll that get later. To, we'll get to we'll that get later. To that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A cornerstone of Tesla's concept of tell uh, automatics was the development of the pervasive technology we know today as radio remote control. He began working on the concept in 1893 and completed his first multi-operational machine in the form of a radio-controlled boat in 1897. Tesla enjoyed the financial support of several high-profile philanthropists, not the least of which was John Jacob Astor IV, owner of the Waldorf Astoria, a real estate developer, inventor, and writer of the book A Journey in Other Worlds, published in 1894. The book details life in the year 2000, predicting worldwide telephone communication, solar power, air and space travel, employing anti-gravity technology, terraforming of other planets, and the technological ability to make adjustments to Earth's axial tilt. The book also foretells of encounters with precognitive ancient spirits on other planets. Another of Tesla's benefactors was a gentleman named John Hayes Hammond, a mining engineer considered to be one of the wealthiest industrialists of the period. With considerable political influence, so much so that he was honored on the cover of the May 1926 issue of Time magazine. Due to his father's vast influence, John Hayes Hammond Jr., known as Jack Hammond, grew up around many of his father's high-profile friends, such as Tesla, the Wright brothers, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, how do you say this guy's name? Guglielmo? Gug- I don't know how. They- it's Marconi, <laughs> the radio inventor. And he was even mentored by Thomas Edison. This inspired Jack to pursue his own career in invention, referring to Tesla and Bell as his scientific godfathers. Having spent time in Tesla's laboratory and witnessing experiments with teleautomatics, young Jack's primary interest was in radio control. By 1908, he began experimenting with his own radio-controlled boats, and his father's status no doubt gained him an audience with the military to sell them on the, poten- uh, sell them on the potential for the development of guided weapons. This prompted concerns from Tesla regarding patent infringement. So, in 1911, Jack made an offer to Tesla for the creation of the Tesla Hammond Wireless Development Company, to which Tesla was amenable. Although this partnership was never formalized, Hammond agreed to share a portion of the proceeds of his radio control patents with Tesla. By 1914, Hammond integrated a gyroscope into the radio control system, which he dubbed Gyrad which allowed him to successfully navigate his ghost ship 120 miles from uh, Gloucester Bay to Boston and back, which was featured in Popular Science magazine. He went on to develop a, to develop a radio-controlled torpedo, a radio jamming device, a variable pitch propeller, and many other patents purchased by the U.S. War Department. Of particular note was his patent for the Telespot, a device for the momentary transmission of high-speed confidential data into a television channel with automatic reception, recording, processing, and display. The prolific inventor went on to secure over 800 foreign and domestic patents and is known as the father of radio control. Such was the public persona for which Jack Hammond was well known. However, in his private life, Hammond held an altogether different passion for that of the paranormal and the occult. Together with his wife, astrologer and psychic Irene Fenton Hammond, the couple conducted seances in the grand gallery of their Gothic castle in uh, Gloucester, M.A., uh, what is that, Massachusetts, while dressed in black hooded robes. In recent years, the castle has become a popular haunted landmark and tourist attraction that has even been featured on the Ghost Hunters television series. As a result of this interest, Jack cultivated a friendship with the skilled psychic medium named Eileen Garrett. Born in Ireland in 1893, Garrett was tested by J.B. Ryan of the Parapsychology Lab at Duke University, who confirmed her astounding abilities in telepathy, clairvoyance, and mediumship. Although she doubted her abilities, when tested in New York 
Garrett was able to verifiably observe and describe objects on a table in a doctor's office in Iceland. She claimed to perform these, perform these feats via the assistance of spiritual controller entities named Uvani, Abdul Latif, Tehote, and Raksna. Of course, Tehote is in there. <laughs> in November 1949, Garrett's reputation drew the attention of a doctor with a keen interest in testing her abilities under laboratory conditions. However, given the technical nature of the proposed experiments, before agreeing to do so, she insisted that the doctor first be vetted by her knowledgeable and trusted friend, Jack Hammond. Garrett arranged a meeting, and in December 1949, John J.'s Hammond Jr. met with the now infamous Dr. Uh, Andrea Puharik. How do you say this guy's name again? Andrea. Uh, Andrea yeah. Pu Puharik. Uh, Puharik, yeah. Yes. In UFOs Part 6, we touched upon Puharik with a primary focus on his communications with the Nine. However, it is ultimately Puharik the man who is vastly more historically significant. Born on the 19th of February, 1918, Carol, or uh, Andrea, as he was nicknamed by his parents, Puharik was the son of Yugoslav immigrants living in Chicago, Illinois during World War II. Puharik obtained his MD from Northwestern University Medical School under the Army Specialized Training Program. According to the official record, in December of 1947, while serving as a second lieutenant in the Army Medical Corps, Puharek received a medical discharge for a chronic middle ear infection and took the opportunity to visit his father in Chicago. It was a promise made to his father on that visit that he claimed ultimately changed the course of his life. As promised, Puharek visited his father's compatriot friend Zlatko uh, Balkovic, living in Camden, Massachusetts. Balkovic... Uh, Balakovic was a world-renowned violinist whose wife, Joyce, was the daughter of one of the most distinguished families in Chicago. Puharik was enthralled by their presence and sophistication, and they soon became very close friends. Joyce wrote books on religious philosophy, and it was through their discussions that the subject of extrasensory perception, or ESP, and thought transference was raised. Of this, Puharik claimed to know virtually nothing, and Joyce proved to be a wealth of knowledge on the subject, even providing him with several examples of such powers described in the Bible. This greatly intrigued Puharik, so much so that in 1949 he was convinced to move across the country from Oakland, California, to Glen Cove, Massachusetts, and establish a laboratory there to, dis to study parapsychological phenomena, which he named the Round Table Foundation of Experimental Electrobiology. To help fund the foundation, the Balakovics introduced Puharik to a number of their influential acquaintances, one of which was a wealthy heiress named Alice Bovier. Uh, Alice inherited her vast wealth when her father, one of the richest real estate investors in the world, perished in the sinking of the RMS Titanic. That man was John Jacob Astor IV, Nik Nikola Tesla's benefactor, which was mentioned previously. Wow. What? That's wild. <laughs> oh my God. In November 1949, Puharik approached psychic medium Eileen Garrett with a request to allow herself to be subjected to laboratory testing at the Roundtable Foundation. Before agreeing to do so, she insisted that he first meet with her friend Jack Hammond. When the two met, they immediately struck what ultimately became a long-lasting friendship. As Puharik described, Jack became my mentor, teaching me more subtleties of life than any book can capture. He taught me the art of invention, how all his ideas came to him in dreams, in reveries, i.e. meditation, etc., Combining Hammond's expertise in electronic radiation... So, uh, Hammond... Jack Hammond Jr. also had his inventions and dreams, just like Tesla, and Tesla was one of his mentors. Exactly. Huh. That's wild. His inventions came to him in dreams and through meditation. And I feel like this guy is a... Isn't he... Um, uh, I'm probably going to screw this up. There was like, you know, like a series of of books that I read as a teenager that were made for teenagers that had an inventor kid whose father was a wealthy engineer. Do you know what I'm talking about? A whole series of them? Uh, okay. 
I feel like this guy is that that character was modeled after this person. Very possible. I think it was because they're old stories. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, okay, combining Hammond's expertise in electronic radiation with his interest in the paranormal, he recalled Tesla's speculation that extrasensory perception may function on the basis of extremely low frequency waves, or ELF. To test this theory, he proposed placing Garrett in a Faraday cage <laughs> to completely isolate her from the electromagnetic waves, which, if the theory proved true, should block her telepathic abilities. Again, according to the official account, through Alice uh, Bouvier, Puharik was able to secure $100,000 in funding for the Foundation's experiments, while Hammond began construction of a seven-foot cubical copper mesh enclosure in his castle. <laughs> Puharik conducted the first of the scheduled three-month series of experiments on March 27, 1951. That was the 7 by 7 by 7 ah, tangent cube. The 7 by 7 by 7 <laughs> tangent cube. Look at that thing. <clears throat> Uh, March, so he con conducted the first of the th scheduled three month experiments on March 27th, 1951. Ms. Garrett was sealed inside the Faraday cage to serve as a telepathic receiver, while Puharik's acquaintance, Lauren Wedlock, sat in a different room serving as the sender. A series of experiments were conducted with the cage grounded and others ungrounded or floating to test for statistical differences which might prove or falsify the electromagnetic transmission theory. Through this series of tests, Garrett's ability to provide details of remote locations inspired Puharik to refer to her ability as traveling clairvoyance. According to Puharik's biography, Memoirs of a Maverick, the experiments utilizing the Faraday cage attracted the interest of both the U.S. and French militaries. Admiral, uh, or I'm sorry, American Colonel Jack Stanley and French General J.C. Sazi visited the Roundtable Foundation in August 1952 to discuss the findings of their experiments. Buharik informed them that a statistical analysis was underway and he would not have any con uh, conclusions until this was finalized. Colonel Stanley instructed Buharik to keep him informed of the progress as the Army may have an interest in his experiments. This analysis was not concluded until three months later, and counterintuitively, the findings reflected a significant improvement in ESP scores within the Faraday cage, which ruled out electromagnetic waves as the conduit, but maybe, maybe saying that there is some interaction. If there's an improvement when you've dampened all the electromagnetic waves, that implies that they have some effect, even if they're not the primary... They uh, interfere. Yeah, they interfere. They, they do. In some right. way, yeah. In some way, right. <clears throat> yeah, which is, I, that's interesting because that means there's an interaction there. With right, which means it's some kind of physical yeah. phenomena, right? Or, or, well, I guess maybe not. I guess the electromagnetic wave could be messing with the parts of her brain that can receive. Still. This. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, don't, I feel like if you're going <laughs> to, I've said this so many times, but if you're going to accept the idea that like the mind is a non-physical, then it is interacting yeah, yeah. in physics in the brain. Yeah, that's so, right. Like, There may be subtle clues to what might be going on further as we get into this and combine it with some of the things we discussed in the last episode. I'm just still, I'm going to stay. There is a connection between. I, I'm going <laughs> to stand my ground. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a, a spiritual realm that is not, that doesn't follow the laws of physics. Well, we don't. We just don't know, all know all the laws, all the laws of physics. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm no, saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe they aren't exactly laws. They're, like, you know. <laughs> well, there's got to be. They're like suggestions that are usually followed. <laughs> but there's rules. That, there's <laughs> rules that can govern when those suggestions can be bent. <laughs> that's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where were we here? This analysis was not concluded until three months later. And counterintuitively, the findings reflected a significant improvement. Uh, as a result, Puharik was requested to present his findings in a meeting at the Pentagon on November 24th, 1952, before the research brand of the Office of the Chief of Psychological Warfare for the U.S. Army. On December 6, 1952, two weeks after his presentation at the Pentagon, Puharik received a draft notice despite his previous medical discharge and was enlisted into the U.S. Army on February 26, 1953. 
and was immediately sent to the Army Medical Field Service School in San Antonio, Texas. Within the first week of his arrival, Puharik was approached by Major General Otis Benson, commander of the School of Aviation Medicine, who had mysteriously learned of the presentation made at the Pentagon, and he requested that Puharik conduct a lecture for base officer and civilian scientists titled Research in Decreasing or Increasing Telepathy, which he conducted at Randolph AFB on March 16, 1953. <clears throat> According to Paharik, the lecture he presented at Randolph AFB caused an uproar because both the U.S. Army and Air Force were attempting to leverage their interest in the subject of telepathy. As a result, in his book, The Sacred Mushroom, Puharik states, I requested a duty assignment, which would allow me to continue my research. I got some whispered assurance to this effect. My duty assignment was to the Army Chemical Center in Maryland which was the hub of quite a bit of psychological, neurophysiological, and chemical research. In light of the preceding historical account, the significance requi- its significance sorry, its significance requires more than a little explanation, albeit in vast vastly abbreviated form, which takes us back to where we left off in part 1. In early 1945, Alan Dulles, is that right? Dulles? Yes. Yeah. While serving as How Berlin, do I know that name. Yeah, it's familiar. You should know that yep, name. We should know it. Yeah, I while serving name. as Berlin station chief for the OSS. Oh, or, he was the he was the, sorry, he was the uh, CIA guy that was then hired for the Warren Commission after the assassination of uh, JFK, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. He was fired by JFK, <laughs> and then he was hired to investigate his assassination. <laughs> Yeah, so he was uh, station chief for the OSS, or Office of Strategic Services, and he began a series of negotiations between the U.S. and the German military command for a separate peace deal known as Operation Sunrise. In this capacity, Dulles greatly overstepped his authority, and upon learning of these negotiations, Stalin was enraged. It should be noted that Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles, who would soon become U.S. Secretary of State, were both corporate attorneys with the influential law firm Sullivan and Cromwell that among their many clients represented (laughs) German pharmaceutical companies. Oh, great. Months before Operation Sunrise, the U.S. and British militaries had initiated the ALSOS mission. Is that right? ALSOS? Yes. Okay. ALSOS. To gather intelligence on Nazi scientific developments in nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons technologies. In the excellent book Phenomena, Writer Annie Jacobson states, The ALSOS group was only vaguely familiar with the Anna Nerby's research. So can you give us a recap on this, Anna Nerby? The, the Anna Nerby was the um, group within the, the Nazi command that was investigating all the really paranormal stuff, okay. really crazy occult stuff. And Okay. So the Alsos group is only vaguely familiar with the Ananerbi's research. Only weeks before, it had come to light that through a division called Applied War Research, the Ananerbi had supplied the Luftwaffe and other military services with living victims from the concentration camps to be used in human experiments. How Heinrich Himmler used the supernatural and the occult as part of the Nazi war effort was not yet understood by Alsos. Because the activities of this strange academy were shrouded in a mystery that just might have concealed something really important, we needed to make a thorough investigation of the organization, Goudschmidt later explained in discussing the Ananerbi. As Jacobson emphasizes, the most critical aspect in dealing with a mystery like Ananerbi's science was to make sure that the information did not fall into Soviet hands. So the Ananerbi relics were crated up and sent to the U.S. Army headquarters in Frankfurt. In August 1944, the Joint Chiefs of the U.S. Army created the Combined Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee to coordinate T-forces to locate and seize Nazi technologies, which in July of 1945 officially became known as Operation Overcast. In May of 1945, the Joint Chiefs also created the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, which initiated a program utilizing agents from the Army Counterintelligence Corps to locate, interrogate, and recruit key Nazi scientists 
through the enemy personnel exploitation section. <laughs> In November of 1945, these objectives were combined, and Overcast was renamed to Operation Paperclip which pitted U.S. agents in a desperate race against the Soviets who were executing mm, Operation uh, Asoviakim <laughs> for the same purposes. Ultimately, Paperclip appropriated approximately 2,000 Nazi scientists while Asoviakim collected over 2,500. I thought it was Operation Potato Chip. <laughs> yes, that's, that's what it is. Operation Potato. Potato yeah. Chip. Potato Chip instead of Paperclip. Okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> Among those sought by Paperclip were Nazi scientists who, as early as 1943, had begun conducting human mind control and interrogation experiments on prisoners at a concentration cap camp at Dachau, utilizing various forms of psychoactive drugs such as mescaline and LSD. As the war progressed, a facility 11 miles south of Frankfurt, known as Oschwerstel West, was used by the Luftwaffe for interrogation of Allied air crews through the use of techniques developed at Dachau. Shortly after the end of the war, the facility was discovered by U.S. forces and was recommissioned as Camp King, for the further development of the Nazi interrogation techniques. By late 1947, the U.S. Navy Medical Research Center initiated a program similar to that undertaken at Dachau known as Project Chatter. As with the Nazi wartime efforts, this entailed the use of a variety of psychoactive drugs. On the afternoon of June 24, 1947, a pilot named Kenneth Arnold was flying his single-engine airplane at 9,200 feet under clear skies near Mount Rainier in Washington, searching for a downed military transport plane when he observed several bright flashes, which he took to be the reflections of sunlight on aircraft canopies. He then observed nine inter intermittently brilliant flying objects, eight of which were shovel-shaped and one which was crescent or bat-shaped. The individual objects were fluttering erratically like flish uh, like fish flipping on concrete, but collectively traveling in an echelon formation performing impossible maneuvers like the tail of a Chinese kite mm -hmm. at what Arnold calculated to be approximately 1,200 miles per hour. The following day, he reported the sighting to a local newspaper and the story was picked up by the Associated Press and spread like wildfire. It was also discovered through subsequent investigations that other ground-based witnesses corroborated Arnold's account. <clears throat> now, correct me if I'm wrong, Marty, but wasn't there something, and this may be a little less known, but there was a, uh, there was another sighting not too long after this or sometime around it where there was a similar objects and one of them ejected material and some people recovered this material. And then, uh, do you know this case? And then it was supposed to be picked yeah. up and these guys went, flew with the material in the plane that they were yeah, flying so the crashed. Plane crashed. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember the dates. <laughs> yeah. Too, too many, too many dates. Too many my, dates. My, yeah. Yeah. I've been down this <clears throat> rabbit hole that it, it's, it's clouded everything around it. Yeah. But yes. And there were, there were sightings before Kenneth Arnold. He's just the one that got Made it a famous. lot of publicity. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. But even, even then, um, Kenneth Arnold's story is not the one that, you know, the lore that is generally repeated is not very accurate no. to what, yeah what he's you know what he experienced right and another thing i've mentioned this on, on another podcast before but uh another thing that's not very well known because it was suppressed that information was kind of suppressed from the media for a long time is that immediately after his sighting uh kenneth arnold started experiencing poltergeist activity in his home mm. hmm yeah i don't remember if i read that or not yeah. that's interesting the, the Why strangeness of that, that. <laughs> yeah, like, the yeah. strangeness of that aspect was purposely purposely suppressed, left out of yeah, yeah, out of the media and everything because it was too weird. The idea of things that we don't know flying around in the sky was too, uh, strange enough, but to to suggest that it had larger paranormal effects, effects was, yeah, yeah, was way beyond the ability for it for the public to, to even but clearly it. these people were already working on this stuff i mean they were you know by this point like it looks I like so. these people were working on like this combination of occult uh 
and you know foo fighters and whatever so like they probably yeah, had already I made they, some kind of connection yeah yes i believe so yeah okay uh where were we at here yeah okay so two weeks later on july 4th 1947 rancher mac uh brazel is that it brazel discovered a large area of debris extending several hundred yards in length on the foster ranch in new mexico which sent Major Jesse Marcel to accompany Brazel to the field, debris field where he collected uh, a few remnants of the materials found and brought them back to the airbase. And then on July 8th, 1947, Public Information Officer Walter Hott, or Hout uh, issued a press release, on, and the Roswell Daily Record ran the headline, RAAF Captures Flying Saucer on Ranch in Roswell Region. Despite an ever-changing series of official explanations, nearly eight decades later, we still do not know what was truly discovered by Brazel outside of Roswell. However, these events were met with considerable public interest, and reports of unexplained objects in the, sc- in the sky grew exponentially. Oh yeah, look at that old headline. Captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. <laughs> <laughs> On September 18th, 1947, three months after Arnold's sighting over Mount Rainier and 72 days after the announcement of uh, Brazel's discovery near Roswell, President Harry S. Truman signed the National Security Act into law, officially establishing the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency. Six months later, in March 1948, The Dulles brothers, with the assistance of the recently appointed first secretary of the Department of Defense, James Forrestal, who died after leaping from a 16th floor kitchen window under mysterious circumstances 14 months later, formed the Office of Policy Coordination, the OPC, the Covert Operations Wing of the CIA. With Alan Dulles serving as deputy director, the OPC went to work to prove that psychological warfare could be a useful tool in fighting the Cold War. At virtually the same time, Air Force General Nathan Twining established Project Sign to, dis- to study the flying saucer mystery. Due to concerns for potential f- uh, foreign technological surprise on December 31st, 1948, the CIA established the Office of Scientific Intelligence, or the OSI, under Assistant Director Dr. H. Marshall Chadwell. A specific area of concern of the OSI was advancements in Soviet mind control programs. It should be noted that Chadwell had previously served as the head of Division 19, a top-secret program under the National Defense Research Committee Office of Scientific Research and Development, established in June 1941 under the executive order of President Roosevelt. Little is known of Division 19's activities other than their involvement in experiments with lethal and non-lethal chemical agents. Also relevant, in December 1952, while serving as assistant director of the OSI, Chadwell sent a memorandum to the director of the CIA, Walter Smith, which stated, Sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial aerial vehicles. Chadwell followed this sentiment with a recommendation that it should be brought to the attention of the National Security Council in order that a community-wide, coordinated effort towards its solution may be initiated. This led to the convening of a panel of non-military scientists, hand-selected by Chadwell and noted physicist H.P. Robertson, to study and present recommendations to the CIA's Intelligence Advisory Committee regarding the UFO phenomenon. As early as 1945, Robertson secretly led a scientific intelligence advisory section investigation of the Foo Fighter phenomenon, and his new assignment became known as the infamous Robertson Panel, which famously recommended a policy of ridiculing witnesses, the use of mass media to educate the public on the subject, and the monitoring, i.e. infiltration, of private UFO investigation groups out out of concern for subversive activities. So this part, <clears throat> this connection with the UFO subject and the intelligence agencies, I think, uh, you know, Valet goes through this in uh, Messengers of Deception. And I felt like he made an interesting case, or at least he was presenting an interesting case that 
he was claiming was being made to him by an intelligence person where the basically the intelligence guy is like this isn't a job for you scientists this is a job for intelligence people scientists study natural phenomena that aren't trying to trick you intelligence people are study that's are studying the activities of other intelligent entities who are trying to trick you yeah, this is a little bit of a tangent but i think i think this is appropriate because it fits with what you're talking about in um in in a previous interview um that i did with with uh alex Sakaris, yeah i mentioned um how it has become fashionable lately to to raise um the uh the idea of plato's cave right? yes yeah and you know, most I'm sure most of your listeners are very familiar with with that allegory of uh, you know we're we're in a cave um, and there is a reality outside of our perception and we only see the shadows cast by the phenomenon. Yeah, right. Whatever's occurring outside of our our perception. And my my argument was that that was not a very good analogy because it. It suggests that the shadows are simply the consequence of things that are occurring beyond our perception. Yeah. It does not factor in that those shadows could effectively be shadow puppets. Yeah. In yeah, other that words, the shadows here's themselves. A rabbit, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. In other words, they're a deception. They're a yeah. purposeful deception. Yeah. It's not, it's not simply a consequence. Yeah. It is purposely trying to mislead us or to lead us down paths that are dead ends yeah and i think that's more or less what what valet was suggesting in, in that as well yeah yeah exactly so i just wanted to point this out because you know the final part of this paragraph here where it says you know the robertson panel saying okay yes use the mass media to educate the public quote unquote also to ridicule the interest uh witnesses and the monitoring or infiltration of private UFO investigation groups out of concern for subversive activities. In this book, Valet was going to many different groups that were being started. They weren't necessarily, like he said, you know, some of them were just your classical UFO investigative people who were just interested, like, I want to go to the site or I want to go talk to the witnesses. But some of these places, these people were forming cults. They were worshiping these entities. And that was where he's meeting these intelligence guys. This is the subversive <laughs> activities they're looking at. because, And I think it just is very interesting because the intelligence guys are already clued into these cults are being started on purpose by the entities. And yes, that does mean that there's going to be subversive activities in them. Because <laughs> the entities started are... by the entities. The either. entities are deceptive. <laughs> <laughs> there's all there's layers of deception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is here. layers. Yeah, they they also can be started by other other powers. Yeah, by right. the government and, guys. And yeah. I think one thing that's very important in this um, is, and I know it's hard to visualize this, but the timeline is critical. Mm -hmm. There's there are a lot of moving parts that are occurring simultaneously. Yeah. Can you give us a brief overview of this timeline? <laughs> Like so far, well, so far, because I mean, I don't made it okay. to 1950. <laughs> no, okay, within three months of of the the, um, the Kenneth Arnold sighting and and Roswell, we had the establishment of the CIA. Hmm. Um, shortly after that, we have the first um, the, uh, Secretary of State or uh, Secretary of Defense, or uh, I mean, Secretary of Defense, uh, along with the CIA create this scientific board, the, uh, the, uh, and then within a 13 months or so of James Forstall commits suicide. Yeah. And under very, very suspicious circumstances. Um, then we have Chadwell create this panel of handpicked scientists to give their opinion of the phenomenon, but yet their opinion was not so much about the phenomenon. It was more on how to handle. Yeah. How to, the, um, how to manage the, the public, how to right? manage, how the, to manage the public 
public's view of the phenomenon. Right. Yeah. And and note the statements being made. And now with that in mind, let's move on and see what happened immediately following this. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna take a break. Yep. And we'll come back and we'll move on. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Good night, Chuck. <laughs> And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast, joined by Marty Garza. And we are going through the spookiest story never told, part two, which is part of the UFO series. I think we're halfway done with the text anyway. But we're up to 1950. So let's see. On April 5th, 1950, CIA director, DCI, Roscoe Hillencotter, is that right? Do you know how to yes. say this? Helen Cotter? Okay. Yeah, Approved Cotter. funding for a covert program named Pro- Project Bluebird, which co- was conducted at Camp King involving... And this Camp King was the... Was a... What? Is this a... a site where they were doing testing, uh, that where the Nazis were doing experiments or... Yeah, what did they call interrogation it? Interrogation experiments on... On... Uh, our, on... Allied pilots. That's right. Osterwell. And then we, right, we discovered that facility and converted it to what we call Camp. Osper Stella West was what they called it. And then they mm-hmm. renamed it. It was captured and renamed Camp King. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we approved funding for a covert program named Project Bluebird, which was conducted at Camp King involving CIA personnel working alongside firm, former Nazi doctors and intelligence agents with the objective of creating an exploitable alteration of personality in selected individuals and specific targets included potential agents, defectors, refugees, POWs, and a vague category defined as others. Shortly after this, Hillencotter retired as DCI and joined his friend and former classmate at the U.S. Naval Academy, Major Donald Kehoe, and anti-gravity researcher Thomas Townsend Brown on the Board of Governors of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, or NICAP, to study the the subject of UFOs. A few other individuals with intelligence ties who also served on the Board of Governors for NICAP were Rear Admiral Delmar Farney, uh, an aeronautical engineer and expert at radio control, Colonel Joseph Bryan III, former head of the CIA's Psychological Warfare Division of the OPC, Harry Cooper, special assistant to the deputy director of the CIA, Charles Lombard, former CIA agent and aide to Senator Barry Goldwater, Alan N. Hall, retired CIA agent who became president of NICAP. Given recent events and the public perception that high-ranking whistleblowers regarding the subject of UFOs are a recent phenomenon, I uh, I will emphasize that on February 28, 1960, the New York Times published an article that quotes Hillencotter as stating, Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, Many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. To hide the facts, the Air Force has silenced its personnel. In a related article, Hillen Cotter is further quoted as stating, The unknown objects are operating under intelligent control. It is imperative that we learn where the UFOs come from and what their purpose is. I know that neither Russia nor this country had anything even approaching such speeds and maneuvers. And the article concludes by stating, Former CIA Director R. H. Hillencotter does not believe the Air Force is telling our citizens the truth about unidentified flying objects. He would have a congressional investigation. His judgment is entitled to extraordinary attention. In the book Wayward... Oh, go ahead. Sounds like that could have been plucked right out of the news today. Yeah, it does. Yep, it does. It sounds like exactly what they're saying about... Calling for congressional hearings. Yep. Saying these things are defying... Mm-hmm. All you know, physics and 
exactly the same things we're hearing now. Yeah. Yeah. These were going on in 1960. Also note, just to, just to save you a little bit of time to process this. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. The Robertson panel makes their recommendation that witnesses should be ridiculed, ridiculed that the public should be educated <coughs> on the subject, yep, and that UFO groups should be monitored, be monitored for subversive, subversive activities. Yep. Immediately after this, the head of the CIA retires, and what does he do? He starts a UFO investigate. Yeah. Should, uh, along with his his former classmate, Donald Kehoe. Yeah. Yep. And Kehoe wrote, a, wrote some books about this too, right? He was... Yes. Yeah. He is the person that introduced the idea of a government cover-up uh, into public consciousness. Mm. So... Yeah. What could be going on there? <laughs> hmm. They're starting them on purpose to draw people in. Is that what you think is happening? Is that what it seems well, like? <laughs> there's some commentary uh, in the next little segment okay. that might we'll explain get to that. it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the next paragraph, I believe. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, okay. In the book Wayward Sons, NICAP and the IC, author Jack Brewer reports that the late researcher Todd Zetchel, who, according to the Washington Post, was a former NSA employee himself, wrote how NICAP drew the attention of the CIA from the very beginning. He asserted that Bernard J. O. Carvalho and Nicholas D. De Rochefort, men on the inaugural 1956 NICAP team, were CIA assets the latter of which was a psychological warfare expert at his day job, and suggested the CIA was interested in keeping tabs on NICAP and gaining access to its unpublished files, and identifying information therein about leakers who approached Kehoe and his staff in confidence. Yeah. So they start this organization, and if they get leakers, the CIA will know about it because they have people in there. Narrative control. Yeah, it's narrative control. In, in Marty's opinion, Brewer's most astute observation regarding, regarding NICAP is that the organization's motives and objectives might be more complex than those that hinged upon stated opinions about UFO riddles. On July 13, 1951, the CIA recruited a chemist formerly working for the National Research Council who, through his work with vasoconstrictors and hallucinogens, was studying how fungi me metabolized in the skeletal portion of plant cells known as lingen, lingen, lignin. Within weeks of his recruitment, the chemist, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, was placed in the position of chief of the technical service staff chemical branch. In this position, Gottlieb's directive was the development of various methods of behavior modification, i.e. mind control, through such methods as hypnosis, electrotherapy, and psychoactive drugs. Then, in August of 1951, Alan Dulles was appointed as deputy director of the CIA, and one of his first orders called for the expansion of Project Bluebird as resources from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and FBI were consolidated into the program, which was renamed Project Artichoke. So within the preceding context, let us return to the saga of Dr. Andrea Puharik. As you will recall, according to official records, Puharik was formally discharged from military service in December 1947 due to a chronic ear infection. He then met the Balakoviks in Maine and through their socialite connections secured funding for the Roundtable Foundation. He then conducted a series of experiments with psychic Eileen Garrett and was later drafted in December 1952. And this is how the story stood. For 40 years, until 1987, when Puharik, was dis uh, Puharik disclosed that following his medical discharge in 1948, he joined a top-secret program named Project Penguin under the auspices of the U.S. Navy and executed under the guise of a little-known organization named Essentia Research Associates, 
with main offices in New, so New York City and a research facility in Dobson, North Carolina. This organization was composed of scientists and businessmen funded by the Pentagon, the Atomic Energy Commission, and later NASA for the purposes of parapsychological research. Puharek remained a member of Ascentia through at least 1985 when a published paper listed him as their director of research. It was on behalf of Essentia Research Associates that Puharek made his presentation an evaluation of the possible usefulness of extrasensory perception in psychological warfare at the Pentagon in November 1952, which resulted in his re-enlistment. The private funding obtained by Puharek's Roundtable Foundation not only came from the who's who of wealthy socialites, such as Alice Astor Bouveret, previously discussed, Arthur Young, inventor of the Bell helicopter, his wife, Ruth Forbes Young, of the Forbes family, and Marcella Dupont, of the Dupont family. The list of donors also included some especially notable individuals, such as Mary Bancroft, the former mistress of DCI Alan Dulles, who, while serving as the Swiss director of the OSS during World War II, used Bancroft's social status to infiltrate the aristocracy of Nazi Germany. It was also Bancroft who introduced Dulles to Carl Jung, who, according to the book The Devil's Chessboard, Dulles recruited as an OSS agent 48, or 488, in 1943, later stating, Nobody will probably ever know how much Professor Jung contributed to the Allied cause during the war. Wow. Another notable donor to the foundation was President Franklin Roosevelt's former vice president, Henry Wallace. Wallace was a prominent Freemason and theosophist with a deep interest in mysticism and spiritualism. In the 1930s, Wallace was responsible for the adoption of the Masonic symbol of the all-seeing eye in the pyramid on the U.S. dollar. And relevant to part one of this miniseries, Wallace was a devotee of Russian mystic Nicholas Rorick, who he referred to in correspondence as his guru. In 1943, Wallace helped fund Rorik's second expedition to Tibet in search of the subterranean kingdom of Shambhala. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Wallace was also present while many of the experiments with Garrett and the Faraday cage were performed. In rattle, uh, ratting out Puharik, uh, researcher Terry Milner... Is that a, a book? Ratting, ratting out Puharik? Yes. Okay. Well... It's a paper. He was going to write a book, oh. um, but uh, he passed away before. Mm. Okay, so the paper is called Ratting Out Puharik. Researcher Terry Milner also alleges an eye-opening list of roundtable associates with a rather curious commonality. The list includes inventor Charles Kettering, who held 186 patents in mechanical and chemical engineering, and was the founder of Delco Electronics Company as well as the head of research at General Motors, which also provided the funding for the foundation, or provided funding for the foundation. Charles Kaufman, vice president of research and development for General Foods Corporation, which also provided funding as well as access to their electron microscope facility. Norman Anderson, a biochemist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory who worked on projects for the Atomic Energy Commission, developed the zonal ultracentrifuge and sought to identify the metabolic profiles of chemical and chemical characteristics of all cell constituents. Shields Warren, a pathologist who specialized in the medical and biological effects of radiation and served as director of the Division of Biology and Medicine for the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Kenneth Cole, principal biophysicist at the University of Chicago's Metallurgical Laboratory during the Manhattan Project. Raymond Zirkel, Principal Investigator of the Manhattan Project's Biology Division and Director of the Institute of Radiobiology and Biophysics, and Army Colonel and later Brigadier General Jack Cooney, Head of the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, which was responsible for all military service functions for the Manhattan Project. As Milner points out, all of these individuals associated with Puharek were members of an organization named the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, which was formally uh, formed jointly by the U.S. War Department and Navy, but served the Atomic Energy Commission under the National Security Act of July 26, 1947. This would seem to suggest that Project Penguin 
was uh, an armed forces special weapons project program acting under the auspices of the arm the uh, atomic energy commission according to puharik project penguin was headed by dr rexford daniels daniels held a phd in mechanical engineering from yale served as a lieutenant commander in navy intelligence held a position at the mit radiation laboratory and in 1952 founded the interference testing and research laboratory in boston in the book Future Science, Life Energies and the Physics of Paranormal Phenomena, Daniels states, In 1963, the scientific advisor to the president and acting director of telecommunications management asked the Joint Technical Advisory Committee to look into the present use of electromagnetic spectrum and make any recommendations needed for improvement and any possible new uses of the spectrum in the future. Daniels served as chairman of the JTAC Task Force Subcommittee, which compiled the side effects section of the 1,200-page report titled Spectrum Engineering, the Key to Progress. Daniels stated, uh, Daniels stated that the task force was instructed to investigate any and all phenomena in nature which might use or interfere with the use of the spectrum now or in the future. He further emphasized that no limits or restrictions were placed upon them, and nothing should be admitted, omitted because of its bizarreness. Commenting on the findings of the task force investigation, Daniels stated, We found eight different individuals or groups who had happened upon an unknown force which penetrated everything, could not usually be measured by conventional electronic instrumentation, did not attenuate according to recognized formulas, and could cause instantaneous reactions at incredible distances. Because of the diversities of use of this force, it appeared that it might even have a spectrum of its own. <clears throat> Each group interested in it had a name descriptive of its use, such as a second force of gravity, or gravitons, hydronics, eloptics, orgone, Baxter's phenomenon, dowsing, radionics, and radiesthesia. So allow me to remind listeners that this statement is oddly reminiscent of the peculiar claims made by the Soviets and the Ananerbi through their investigations discussed in part one of this miniseries. Yeah. <clears throat> the suggestion that there's an entire other spectra, you know, is, is one that I find very interesting. Then it may have some... I think that connects, yeah. that connects with the experiments with Elaine Garrett in the Faraday cage. Yes, Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> Furthermore, in their book, The Secret Life of Plants, which focuses on the study of extrasensory perception in plant life, authors Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird further state that Daniels has become convinced that some overall force exists in the universe which is itself intelligent and provides answers. Daniels theorizes that this force operates through a whole spectrum of frequencies not necessarily linked to the electromagnetic spectrum, and that human beings can mentally interact with it. <laughs> yep. If that's true and it's intelligent, the force itself is, is intelligent. That would explain a lot of things. When Puharik was re-enlisted in February 1953, he was stationed at the Army Medical Field Service School in San Antonio, Texas, where he was approached by Major General Otis Benson, commander of the School of Aviation Medicine, to conduct a presentation to officer and civilian scientists at Randolph, at Randolph Air Force Base. So this begs the question, who were the scientists present, and what research might they have been conducting at Randolph AFB? Prior to Major General Benson's leadership as SAM commander, the position was held by Major General Harry Armstrong. Armstrong was a medical physician who, while stationed at Wright Field in 1934, discovered an underground chamber that housed a low-pressure vessel, which he surmised could be used to simulate high-altitude testing, which ultimately led to major advancements in aviation technology. Armstrong was eventually appointed as director of the Aero Medical Research Laboratory at Wright Field and is considered one of the pioneers of aviation medicine. What does this mean he, he discovered? Okay, so there was just this... He found an underground facility at Wright-Patterson. Yeah that had uh, a low pressure chamber and I don't know what they were using it for, but nor did he, Yeah, he figured that 
that could be used to simulate high altitude experiments okay. and things like that. Yeah. So it was just some chamber down there with this thing in it, and he was like, and no one was using it, and he's like, oh, I can use this to do other science. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. At Wright Patterson Air Force. Base. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, on October 2nd, 1937, Armstrong attended the first ever Aero Medical Association conference held in the Astor Gallery of Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where he met of Dr. Course. Yes. <laughs> yes, of, of course. course, it's in the, the Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria. Astoria. Yeah. Where he met Dr. Hubertus Strughold, a med medical physician and director of the Aviation Medical Research Institute of the Reich Air Ministry in Berlin, the equivalent to position to Armstrong's in Germany. They had much in common, including their age, and the two quickly struck a friendship. Given his expertise at the end of World War II, Armstrong was assigned the responsibility of locating a select group of Luftwaffe doctors for the exploitation of certain incomplete German aviation medical research projects, all of whom were considered authorities in a particular field of medicine. And these individuals were to be relocated to the top secret Army Air Force's Aero Medical Center in Heidelberg. Armstrong assembled a list of 115 of the most important Nazi doctors for appropriation, and at the top of the list was his friend, Dr. Hubertus Strughold. This action initiated a foot race, not only against the Soviets, but also against the United Nations War Crimes Commission, which was actively searching for the perpetrators of untold wartime, wartime atrocities. Following his apprehension, Strughold negotiated a deal and agreed to cooperate with U.S. physicians in classified medical research. He selected 58 of his top Nazi scientists to be included in the project, which was conclude, conducted at the top secret facility in Heidelberg under the leadership of Armstrong and right under the nose of the Nuremberg trials for war criminals being conducted less than 150 miles from the facility. In January of 1946, Armstrong was reassigned as commander of the School of Aviation Medicine at Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio. In August of 1947, Armstrong brought Strughold to Randolph, where he was responsible for overall supervision of the professional activities of the German and Austrian scientists employed by the school. The program at Randolph involved 34 Nazi scientists, including Dr. Walter Schreiber, who possessed detailed information of medical problems in connection with desert and Arctic warfare and was in a position to provide authoritative information and serve as a consultant on vitally important medical matters in Russia. In 1948, Armstrong and Strughold hosted the first ever U.S. military panel discussion on biology in space, only months after Strughold's team conducted experiments with Werner von Braun at White Sands testing range involving a rhesus monkey, launched into space aboard a V-2 rocket. In 1953, Strughold advanced the theory that Mars may at one time have been the home of intelligent life and held a briefing on the possibility of meeting a civilization from another planet. He also predicted that we would discover water in Mars's polar ice cap. He went on to publish this line of speculation in a book titled The Green and Red Planet. Despite countless allegations of his wartime participation in horrific human experimentation, Strughold's slate was wiped clean, and he went on to be widely regarded as the father of aerospace medicine. <laughs> the experiments that he conducted, I initially thought of putting them in. Mm. They're horrific. Yeah. Like. Too horrific. Putting people in low pressure chambers. Oh yeah. Jeez. Till yeah, till they would explode. Yeah. And just all sorts of unbelievable things. Mm. In June of 1949, Armstrong was promoted to Deputy Surgeon General of the Air Force in Washington D.C. and his position as SAM commander at Randolph Air Force Base was filled by Major General Otis Benson, who previously served as technical supervisor for Nazi scientists at Heidelberg. And it was he who requested that Puharek re conduct the presentation, Research in Decreasing or Increasing Telepathy, for the scientists at Randolph, many of whom were former Nazis in March of 1953. Perhaps it is also simply a coincidence that at approximately the same time, 
San Antonio, a San Antonio resident claims to have suffered traumatic psychological abuse as a child in an underground laboratory at Randolph Air Force Base, specifically referring to the use of Faraday cages. These memories were suppressed for decades until the individual began writing about his bizarre, lifelong experiences in association with his alien abduction accounts in the best-selling book Communion. I, of course, am referring to the prolific author Whitley Strieber. Wait, Whit Whitley's from San Antonio? <laughs> yes. I did not know that. How did I not know that? <laughs> what? <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh my god. So that that could raise a lot of questions. Yeah. Yep. So are his abduction experiences something that was yeah, put into it, his memory? Like are they screen right. memories? It, is it connected to yes, right. To this or did something they did there turn something result on result yeah that's what in i was thinking yeah his abductions. the experiments mm -hmm. resulted in his, the, yeah his connection to whatever this other phenomena is yeah crazy but probably not <laughs> <laughs> to totally unrelated just probably just put him on a bunch of drugs and he just <laughs> dreamed it all Oh great! <laughs> the watcher used to work at <laughs> work there. Oh no wonder! Do you, do you... Oh well, that explains that a whole explains lot of things. Lot. Just, yeah, spot that's how spook. he knows all this stuff. Yeah, spot the spook. <laughs> We've spotted the spook. We have a spook in our own show. I know. <laughs> this is just making me think of one other thing that's that's kind of unrelated, but the idea of science being supreme. Yeah. Is what results in some of this horrific shit. Yep. Yes. Yep. Now, I'm not trying to say that other things don't result in horrific shit, but with science, there's uh, there's no moral code. You know, what's the where are the limitations on what types of experiments or things should be done? Science for the sake of science or science. Yeah, yeah for, for the knowledge. sake of just discovery, knowledge, all that. Just uh, Yeah, you... It's good to have a little bit of both. You yeah, know? you go into the past and people are setting people on fire because they're witches or they don't believe the same things. Then you come to the future and people are setting people on fire for science. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And they're all telling themselves that they're doing something for the greater good. Yeah. That's, to me, the... Yeah, I guess if you make any... Yeah. Yeah, I have to think about that. Yeah. Annie Jacobson in the book Phenomenon um discusses this quite a bit that this was justified. The idea of bringing these war criminals over to the United States has to be put in the context yeah. of the time period. Yep. We were in the Cold War. People didn't know if we were going to have a nuclear war the next day or any at any moment. So they felt that they had to do whatever it took, no matter how horrific. Yep. Whatever they needed to do to gain an upper hand. It was just they would justify it in their mind for the greater good. Yeah, yeah. we've we've I, we've I talked about this before that there was like a there was like a calculus involved, like, you know, in your mind, you're like, well, the Soviets are chasing them down, these scientists, and they're getting all this knowledge. And like, if we don't get this knowledge too, we won't be able to keep up. And then, the, you know, uh, so it's it is. There's no slope. There's no yeah. good decisions to be made. You know. Yep. But things have a tendency to build momentum. Yeah, you can't stop it once it yep. gets going. This yeah. is pretty good. The watcher's saying, like, anytime you make the result more important than. The cost. Yeah. Yeah, the ends justify the means. Yeah. That's that, yeah. That's when it when it gets dangerous. Yeah. Okay, so listeners will recall that according to the official record, a rift arose between the Army and the Air Force following Puharek's presentation at Randolph Air Force Base. 
This prompted Puharik to submit a request for reassignment to the Army Chemical Center. This more accurately refers to the infamous Edgewood Chemical Biological Center at Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. In 1948, the U.S. Army Chemical Corps initiated a classified program known as the Edgewood Human Experiments, which involved, which evolved into Operation Delirium, from the Latin term to rave, conducted at Edgewood Arsenal. According to Rafi, ooh, I'm not even going to, what is this, Marty? (laughs) Catchadorin of the New Yorker magazine, who obtained information about the program through a series of Freedom of Information Act requests, these experiments involved as many as 7,000 U.S. soldiers who were subjected to a variety of chemical agents, many developed during World War II by Nazi scientists. These included EA-1476, a synthetic THC extract known as red oil, mescaline, LSD, and a lesser known and even more powerful psychoactive agent, EA-2277, known as BZ, short for th- three... Uh, Hmm, let's see. Yeah. Quis- <laughs> Quinuda, cl- uh, no, quinuclidinyl benzylate, where the hallucinogenic effects of LSD may last for hours, those of BZ lasted for days. Mm. These experiments were conducted to test non lethal brain effects on function, incapacitation, and other vaguely worded criteria. For listeners who are interested to know more about the Edgewood human human experiments, I recommend the book Chemical Warfare, Secrets Almost Forgotten by Dr. James Ketchum. In the book A Terrible Mistake, author H.P. Abarelli quotes from a presentation made by Puharik shortly after arriving at Edgewood where he made the following prediction. In the not-too-distant future, a select cadre of soldiers will possess the ability to telepathically accomplish critical intelligence tasks and may well hold the mental abilities to observe and counteract enemy movements and tactics. On April 10, 1953, DCI Alan Dulles presented a speech at the National Alumni Conference at Princeton. In that speech, he made the following startling pronouncements. Quote, In the past few years, we have become accustomed to hearing much about the battle for men's minds, the war of ideologies, and indeed our government has been driven by the international tension we call the Cold War to take positive steps to recognize psychological warfare and to play an active role in it. I wonder, however, whether we clearly perceive the full magnitude of the problem, whether we realize how sinister the battle for men's minds has become in Soviet hands. We might call it, in its new form, brain warfare. The target of this warfare is the minds of men both on a collective and on an individual basis. Its aim is to condition the mind so that it no longer reacts on a free will or rational basis, but responds to impulses implanted from outside. If we are to counter this kind of warfare, we must understand the techniques the Soviet is adopting to control men's minds. There is an old adage that Everyone is crazy but me and thee, and sometimes I suspect thee. There is more truth than we realize in this saying. In the freedom that we enjoy, it is hard for us to realize that in the great area behind the Iron Curtain, a vast experiment is underway to change men's minds, working on them continuously from youth to old age. Such an experiment has never before been undertaken on so vast and so well-organized a scale. In Hitler's Germany and in fascist Italy, some effort was made to make men into a single pattern. In Germany, it was called hmm, Gleichaltung, the leveling process. Good. This effort covered only a few years and may have had little permanent effect on the German mind, though it did have its effect on history in conditioning the Germans in vast numbers to follow Hitler's mad experiments. The Soviet experiment is very different. It takes two forms. First, the attempt at mass indoctrination of hundreds of millions of people so that they respond uh, docilely to the orders of their master. This permits the creation of a monolithic solidarity in the Soviet state, which outwardly gives it the appearance of great unity. Second, the perversion of the minds of selected individuals who are subjected to such treatment that they are deprived of the ability to state their own thoughts. Parrot-like, the individuals so conditioned can merely repeat thoughts which have been implanted in their minds by suggestion from outside. In effect, 
The brain under these circumstances becomes a phonograph, playing a disc put on its spindle by an outside genius over which it has no control, unquote. Pretty scary. Yep. Three days later, on April 13th, sorry, what? It's like he was predicting the future. Yeah, it is. Three days later. Repeating things, repeating things without critically thinking about them. Yeah, that's right. Yes. (laughs) Parrot-like. Three days later, on April 13th, 1953, Dulles doubled down on the CIA's mind control program, Artichoke, and initiated a new and even broader program named MKUltra, which surreptitiously utilized a network of more than 80 universities, hospitals, and institutions in the U.S. and Canada. Under the direction of the chief of the TSS chemical branch and liaison to Lockheed, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, MK Ultra, uh, sorry, liaison to Lockheed, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, MK Ultra was a massive umbrella program with many sub projects that aimed to leave no stone unturned in the search for methods of behavior modification. In this regard, author Arborelli reports quote, Since February 1952, TSS officials have been had been intrigued with Puharik's claims about telepathy and clairvoyance, especially in connection with the device Puharik employed called a Faraday cage. Gottlieb, who may have been in over his head on the subjects of telepathy and psychics, was acutely aware that U.S. Army officers at the Pentagon and in Army intelligence were especially interested in the Faraday cage. The TSS had no intention of being left in the proverbial dust by the Army on any potentially significant scientific development, unquote. All right, I'm about to take a break here. Any government that starts a program designed to study changing human behavior needs to be... uh, Totally destroyed. Totally wiped out. (laughs) I should say just the program. That that is unacceptable for you to study, government. That's right. That's what I mean. Yeah, I get it. All right. Yet before be- initiating the program, he made a speech about it publicly. Yeah, yeah. It's what happens when you don't pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll take a break. Break time. Got another <laughs> segment and then probably one more after that. Well, uh, we're doing good, actually. We're doing good. We're getting to the... Now we're starting to get closer to the point. Yeah. <laughs> the, the point of there we're is a almost, point Yeah, this. Marty's about to make a point, folks, <laughs> when we come back. So <laughs> long lead up. We're back again for the final segment here on Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. I didn't hit record the first time I said this. Fortunately, we didn't get too far into the uh, segment before huh. we figured it out. <clears throat> the infamous missing record button. Yeah. But uh, yeah, let's get back into it. Yeah. Russ thinks he can knock it out in this I, last segment. I think we can finish it, yeah. And then maybe <clears throat> we'll have time for... Some, nope, no, <laughs> maybe. Okay, so <clears throat> in November 5th, 1953, Puharik met with CIA officials and psychological warfare experts who were interested in funding his ESP research. However, in that meeting, it was emphasized that the funds would need to go through a university that would act as a blind to conceal the CIA's official involvement. Several months later, Puharik conducted another lecture at Edgewood on ESP for a select group from the CIA and Camp Dietrich, home of the U.S. Biological Weapons Program, where he pronounced, extrasensory perception is a reality and that it could be proven in people with exceptional talent. In his book, The Sacred Mushroom, Puharik elaborates on the ensuing discussion, stating, I pointed out 
that there was also evidence to the effect that the talent was widely diffused throughout a normal population and that it was probable that everyone has some of it sporadically. In response to this assertion, Commanding Officer Colonel Norman W. Elton may have inadvertently re revealed the true purpose of the meeting when he stated, Well, if this is true, isn't it possible to find some drug that will bring out this latent ability so that normal people could turn this thing on and off at will? Puharek replied, It would be nice to have such a drug. You see, the main problem in extrasensory perception research is that we never know, even in a person of great talent, when this mysterious faculty will manifest itself. So we just sit around like a fisherman in a boat who puts his hand in the water every once in a while, hoping that a fish will sw swim into his grasp. There have been some reports of primitive peoples using such drugs extracted from plants, but I have never heard of one that worked when tested in the laboratory. In response, Elton stated, Well, if you ever find a drug that works, let me know, because this kind of thing would solve a lot of the problems connected with intelligence. <clears throat> One notable, wow. yeah, one notable individual stationed at Edgewood during that period was an Italian immigrant named Francis Vincent Zappa, the father of the legendary psychedelic rocker Frank Zappa. In his autobiography, The Real Frank Zappa, he states, My dad was employed as a meteorologist at the Edgewood Arsenal. They made poison gas there during World War II, so I guess it would have been the meteorologist's job to figure out which way the wind was blowing when it was time to shoot the stuff off. However, in light of allegations regarding experiences at Randolph Air Force Base, Zappa's elaboration might raise questions about his father's true occupation and what might have been going on in his household. In describing his father's activities, he states, He used to bring equipment home from the lab for me to play with, beakers, Florence flasks, little Petri dishes full of mercury. A good dad. Yeah. He also <laughs> goes on to describe a rather peculiar treatment he received there for earaches and asthma, stating, The doctor had a long wire thing, maybe a foot or more, and on the end was a pellet of radium. He stuffed it up my nose and into my sinus cavities on both sides. <laughs> he further <Wow>. adds, <laughs> My dad used to help pay the rent by volunteering for human testing of chemical and maybe even biological warfare agents. These were called patch tests. The army didn't tell you what it was they were putting on your skin, and you agreed not to scratch it or peek under the bandage, and they would pay you ten bucks per patch. My dad used to come home with three or four of those things on his arms in different parts of his body every week. Oh, my God. Curiously, Francis Zappa, with family in tow, eventually relocated to Lancaster, California, where the meteorologist somehow inherited the qualifications to receive employment at Lockheed, and later Convair as an engineer and metallurgist, of course. Yeah, he's a meteorologist, but, you know. This was fortuitous as his son went on to become one of the most influential musicians in the drug-fueled psychedelic rock movement spawned in California in the 1960s and 70s, which was aided by the likes of Jim Morrison, the son of Navy Rear Admiral George Morrison, who named his band The Doors after author Aldous Huxley, Huxley's book The Doors of Perception which recounts Huxley's hallucinogenic experience with mescaline. Coincidentally, Aldous Huxley was a close personal friend of Puharek, who spent time at the Roundtable Foundation and praised Puharek as one of the most brilliant minds in parapsychology. So which See, member... man, they even infiltrated rock and roll, bro. <laughs> yeah. It's like hey. it's all there. <clears throat> which member of the Doors? Morrison. Morrison. It was, it was, okay, it was Morrison. Huh? Jim Morrison, whose dad yeah. was a Navy Rear Admiral. <laughs> uh. While stationed at Edgewood, Puharek worked alongside Dr. Frank Olson, a bacteriologist and bioweapons bio engineer under contract with the CIA's Special Operations Division, who worked on MK Ultra subproject MK Naomi. Olson was skeptical of Puharek's research, and the two clashed on several occasions. Following a briefing on hallucinogenic plants presented by Puharek to the Chemical Corps Biological Division, Olson voiced his skepticism, which nearly resulted in a physical altercation, were it not for Colonel Elton's intervention, but instead ended with Puharek referring to Olson as a frightened schoolboy who had not yet managed to overcome his fear of the dark. 
Olson famously met his demise under mysterious circumstances on November 28, 1953, when he inexplicably threw himself from a 10th floor window of the Statler Hotel in New York nine days after being surreptitiously dosed with LSD by the head of MK Ultra, Sidney Gottlieb, and his deputy, Robert Lashbrook, who also happened to be sharing a room with Olson on that fateful night. The hotel's night manager, who rushed to Olson's aid, later stated, In all my years in the hotel business, I never encountered a case where someone got up in the middle of the night, ran across a dark room in his underwear, avoiding two beds, and dove through a closed window with the shade and curtains drawn. Shades of James Forrestal. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, people who think they're saving the world. In addition to the use of hallucinogenic and electronic means of exerting influence on the human mind, hypnosis was also explored as an extension of an artichoke side project named QK Hilltop, conducted at Cornell University. But under MK Ultra, this research was secreted away through an organization innocuously named the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology, or the Human Ecology Fund. Coincidentally, six months before Olson's death, Puharik had attended a demonstration of hypnosis and sleight of hand at the Statler Hotel on behalf of the CIA. Also in attendance was a prominent New York stage magician named John Mulholland, who had been contracted by Gottlieb under MK Ultra Subproject 4 to create an operations manual on the art of deception for CIA operatives. Wow. That Got- guy looks like the Joker. He does. <laughs> Gottlieb indicated in part... The scope of this subproject is the collection, in the form of a concise manual, of as much pertinent information as possible in the fields of magic as it, re- as it relates to covert activities. The information collected will be pertinent to the problem of surreptitiously administering, uh, administering liquid, solid, or gaseous substances to unknowing subjects. On the night of Olson's death, the police reviewed a receipt signed by Mulholland contained in the pants pocket of Olson's roommate, Lashbrook. The receipt was for an advance for travel expenses for one of several trips Mulholland made to Chicago on behalf of the CIA. Three days after Olson's death, Mulholland traveled there to attend a seminar on hypnosis where he met with Puharik and associates from the Armour Research Research Foundation attached with the Illinois Institute of Technology, who performed classified scientific research for the Department of Defense on radio interference. Arborelli writes that Mulholland later claimed that during the meeting he became so frightened of something that Puharik did that he abruptly left the meeting, aborted his Chicago stay, and immediately flew back to New York. Put a pin in that. Okay. That whole that whole paragraph is important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it seems like he was assa- this guy was assassinated. Okay, so shortly after Mulholland wrote a critical report to Gottlieb on Puharik titled A New Type of Experiment in Parapsychology, clearly indicating that the CIA had been closely monitoring Puharik's activities and performance. With shades of the magician and arch skeptic the amazing James Randi, co-founder of uh how do you say this? Psychops. Psychops. That's right. C S I C O P S the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal. In 1952, magician and would-be soothsayer John Mulholland wrote an article for for Popular Science magazine on the subject of UFOs, in which he stated, Magic is a maze into which the magician lures his audience. He adds extraneous details to clutter and confuse their minds. Then he leads them, by misdirection, to take the wrong turn. Do I think that flying saucers are only a 20th century superstition? Yes, I do. In less scientific ages, people believed in and saw fairies and elves, dragons, mermaids, vampires, werewolves, and leprechauns, and ghosts. Scores of sailors have sworn that they saw that spectral ship, the Flying Dutchman. Whatever the saucers are, mirages, meteors, lights reflected from the earth, or whatnot, they probably have been around for a long time. Flying saucers are a state of mind. For four decades of magic have taught me that honest, intelligent, alert men and women can, by suggestion, quite readily be made to see things which aren't there. Wow. That's an interesting perspective right yeah. there. <laughs> That's Adding really cool. extraneous details yeah. that confuse. Yeah. I get the connection. 
to basically everything you've been saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Despite his lack of any apparent qualifications in early 1956, Gottlieb inexplicably requested that Mulholland discreetly investigate events surrounding an unidentified aerial object and related phenomenon witnessed in the skies and on the ground in Kentucky. On August 21st, 1955, Billy Ray Taylor visited his friend Elmer Sutton at his family's farmhouse in Kelly, Kentucky, just outside of Hopkinsville. Hopkinsville. That evening, Taylor went outside to draw a bucket of water from a well when he observed a bright disc-shaped object fly overhead and land in a wooded area near the Sutton home. Taylor ran back inside and told the four adults and several children what he had seen. Skeptically, Sutton agreed to follow Taylor back outside for a look where they saw no sign of the alleged object. As they started back toward the home, they suddenly noticed an approximately four-foot-tall, silver-gray, glowing humanoid creature with large glowing eyes, very long arms with claws, and bat-like ears floating across the ground coming out of the woods. Yep, that would be, uh, that would be terrifying. <laughs> The men ran inside the home to alert the others as what they believed were several of the creatures began surrounding the farmhouse, peering in through the windows and doors. Oh, this is the, yeah, this is the Hopkinsville, uh, and the Hopkinsville goblins. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a classic case. Okay, so Sutton and his brother grabbed their shotguns and Taylor a twenty two rifle and they began firing at the creatures. Like a scene from a bizarro shooting gallery, as the creatures were shot at close range, they seemed to backflip and float back into the woods. This invasion persisted for approximately three hours until the assailants allowed the opportunity for the Suttons and Taylors to escape. They piled into two vehicles and headed into Hopkinsville, Hopkinsville where they immediately contacted the chief of police, who then contacted the military authorities at Fort Campbell. Several police officers and military investigators accompanied the family back to the home to conduct a search and investigation, but were unable to find any evidence of the invaders. Then, shortly after the investigators departed the scene, the creatures reappeared and resumed their pre previous onslaught. This resulted in another round of gunfire, which was unabated until approximately 5.45 a.m. when the creatures finally relented. The alleged incident deeply affected the Suttons, who soon moved away as a result of the ridicule they suffered when the story received media attention. Regardless of what might really have happened that night, all those involved truly believed they were victims of an alien attack. Unfortunately, no documents related to Mulholland's CIA investigation have ever been located or obtained through FOIA requests. In an interview in 1997, Abarelli asked Gottlieb for his opinion on the subject of UFOs, to which he replied, They were out of my reach of knowledge. I found the subject fascinating, as do a lot of people. That something is there, and that people see something, is unquestioned. I think, for me, it's best to leave it like that. Arborelli followed up, Did the CIA leave it like that? And Gottlieb replied, I assume not. No. This making me think of this uh, recent story where the woman it, like freaks out on the plane mm. and is just like, this guy that I'm sitting next to back here is not real. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see this? Yeah. <laughs> we in, in, was it Revelations? We discussed the, I don't remember his name now, the guy that was on, uh, he was a computer scientist that was on a bus going to a, a job interview and all of a sudden pulls a knife out and decapitates the guy sitting next to him because he was told it was a demon uh, just spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah. She like stops, makes him, st I guess the plane was still on the tarmac or whatever. And they had to, everybody had to get off the plane. <laughs> yeah. But she's just like, I'm there's, not, a, there's a lizard person on there. She's like, <laughs> that guy is not real. <laughs> <laughs> she's like pointing back there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it makes, you know, it makes you laugh. It's obviously it's like, wow, something you're, you know, you think something's wrong with that person, but, but maybe, maybe something's wrong with that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Say something, Marty. <laughs> well, we're, we're coming to the heart of the matter here. We're starting to get into the, into the, like, so 
You don't have to agree with, with question, me. Right. <laughs> well, I do agree with okay. you. That's the thing <laughs> is that we don't know exactly what's going on. What is, what is, what is the impetus for this? In other words, is yeah. it the, is, are these people crazy or were they drugged Yeah. or are they being influenced <clears throat> in some way? Or what exactly that, is going yeah. on? Why was Mulholland who knew nothing yeah. by his own admission, knew nothing about UFOs. Why was he sent to investigate a UFO? Encounter the Hopkinsville encounter. By, yeah. by Gottlieb. Do you, do you think that she was looking for him to see if there was misdirection? Is that the, I mean, that's the implication, right? He's a stage magician. So like you have to look at, okay, what's he good at? Yeah. And then here's his opinion on this whole thing. And then she's like, well, why don't you go investigate this weird case then? Tell me what you think, magician. Let's see what you got to say about it. Yeah? Maybe as we no. get more information of what was going on behind the scenes, okay. documentation or that you was think, obtained later. Do you think he was sent there to cause misdirection? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> okay. Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, the, the I mean, James Randi was, I mean, that whole situation was always weird to me, that guy. So... It's weird how these people get involved in this. Okay. Exactly. In 1957, a journalist and close associate of Puharic named John Fuller published an article on parapsychology featuring the work of Dr. J.B. Rhine and Dr. Carlos uh, Osis, Osis at Duke University. At the time, Fuller was presumably unaware that their research was funded by the Department of Defense and the CIA. As a result of the article, a few weeks later, Fuller was invited by Osis to meet in his office at the Parapsychology Foundation, where he served as director, a short five-minute walk from the Statler Hotel in New York City. Where at, Frank Olson fell out of a window. Right. <laughs> at the foundation, Osis was working with psychic medium Elaine Garrett, studying the near-death experiences. Later he was published working with Paharic. Right, working with Paharic. Yeah. <laughs> Later publishing the results of their work in a report in 1961 titled Deathbed Observations by Physicians and Nurses. Osis has become, had become interested in such cases after reading a book published in 1924 titled Deathbed Visions, which described a credible case documented by a hospital surgeon. The surgeon reported that a terminal patient just before her death described seeing her deceased father, but more confusing was the claim that he was accompanied by her sister, Vida. The patient did not understand how this could be because as far as she knew, her sister was alive and well. However, the surgeon was aware that Vita had died a month earlier, but withheld the information from the woman due to her fragile condition. Wow. In addition to Garrett, among Osis's many associates was, Doc, was John Mulholland. As Arborelli states, Osis was especially interested in certain facets of magic, and his association with Mulholland focused primarily on vanishing objects and dematerialization. Mulholland and Osis also shared a deep fascination with apparitions and poltergeist phenomena, which they discussed extensively. This is seemingly out of character for Mulholland, as he was quite the skeptic of all things paranormal and had even published a book on the subject in 1938 titled Beware familiar spirits. Interestingly, Osis was also an associate of Gottlieb and Lashbrook, with whom he met at CIA headquarters in Washington, D.C. on at least two occasions. Furthermore, Gottlieb openly expressed deep respect for Osis's research into the paranormal. During Fuller's meetings, meeting with Osis, the latter mentioned the Sandoz Company in Switzerland and their synthesis of a fungus... Ergot, in 1938, dubbed lysergic acid, uh, dif I can never say this word, dithalamide, is that right? Otherwise known as LSD. Fuller was told that although the substance was initially commercially marketed for psychiatric use in 1947, its existence was wholly unknown to the public, and that no journalists have yet been invited to write about the drug. But if he was interested, he could be the first. However, Osis followed up his offer with a warning that sometimes the drug could create extremely adverse reactions and made a, it a point to emphasize that he should not consider the idea if he were undergoing any particular period of strain at the time. This condition would almost certainly engender the adverse reactions 
and the experiment would be useless in exploring the consciousness-expanding qualities of the drug. Given such considerations, Fuller respectively decli- respectfully declined. The let discussion reminds... Let, let yeah. me interject it's just for a second. Yeah, go ahead. We've heard this um, before, um, how information is a currency of its own. Yeah. And sometimes the promise of information or access to information can be used as a carrot to get people to do certain things or yep. say certain things. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> 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 That's not helpful, Marty. <laughs> well, I was going to say you're he was, reminding me. He was me... offered. He was offered. He was made an offer. Yeah, and he was like, "Nope, no thanks." Yeah, well, he declined okay. it. That That's also, his version. Yeah. That also seems to happen, you know, in demonology, right? Like the yeah. demons are like, "Hey, I will give you, yeah, infinite knowledge." Yeah, if you draw. Sp- cool designs on the ground and light some cool candles. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. but seriously, like that that that's what I thought you were talking about. <laughs> okay, so the discussion reminded Fuller of an article he had read 6 years earlier which reported that the beginning that beginning on August 16th, 1951, doctors in the small province uh so how do you say this France French place. Uh, hold on, I'm having issues with my uh, my Pont, share screen. Pont Saint Pont, d'Esprit. Yes. Or Pont Saint Esprit, something like that. Yeah. So in Pont Saint Esprit, France, were inundated by a large number of patients who were experiencing severe and wide-ranging hallucinations. Over the next two days, over 250 residents were overcome by this unexplainable affliction. 34 of the stricken were subsequently interned in asylums, and although records were poorly kept, at least four people died and many others suffered long-term effects. Oh, man, look at that picture. Rumors and speculation ran rampant about the cause of the apparent poisoning. Some believed that Satan had been released on the streets of Pont uh, Saint-Esprit. Others believed that the... uh, how do you say this? Their police, basically, the local policing authorities had purposely poisoned the water supply. And yet others claimed to have witnessed a low-flying, unmarked aircraft that had sprayed the town with an unknown chemical. Although Fuller acknowledged knowing little of the subject, in the summer of 1965, he was investigating a series of UFO sightings in Exeter, New, Hamp- New Hampshire, when he was informed by a local editor of a couple who shared a very strange encounter in the White Mountains a few years prior. On September 19, 1961, the couple was returning home to Portsmouth from a trip to the Canadian border, when near Lancaster, New Hampshire, they encountered a strange craft with what appeared to be beings on board. A letter describing the incident was subsequently mailed to Major Donald Kehoe at NICAP by the woman involved, indicating that her husband's mind has completely blacked out regarding details of the incident. This report was forwarded to Walter Webb, an astronomer who studied under J. Allen Hynek and was serving as the scientific advisor to NICAP and who was the first investigator to interview the couple. During their initial interviews, the couple had conscious recollections of observing the craft through binoculars, which they described as a band of light, first straight, then somewhat convex as if conforming to the edge of a flattened disk. And they could also detect something else. The strange object was traveling very erratically in step-like flight pattern, tilting vertically as it climbed each step, leveling off, dropping vertically, leveling off, tilting upward again, etc. All the time, it seemed to be spinning. As the craft descended, additional details became discernible, of which they noted the lighted edge of the object, a row of windows through which a cold, bluish-white fluorescent glow shone, was visible and a red light on each side of the object could be seen. The UFO, hovering in a slightly tilted position, was no longer spinning. The lights were on the tips of two pointed fin-like structures sliding outward from the sides of the ship. Despite the spectacle, the craft's appearance was ultimately not the most perplexing aspect of the encounter. To get a better look, the husband husband 
exited their vehicle and observed eight to eleven separate figures watching him at the windows. They seemed to be standing in a corridor that encircled a central section. Suddenly there was a burst of activity. The figures scurried about, turned their backs, and acted as if they were pulling levers on the wall. He went on to further describe them as of human form, dressed in shiny black uniforms and blade caps with peaks or bills on them, which could be seen when the figures turned their heads. The uniforms were like glossy leather. In his notes, Webb wrote, The figures reminded the observer of the cold precision of German officers. They moved smoothly and efficiently and showed no emotion except for one fellow operating a lever who looked over his shoulder and smiled. After 14 months of investigation, and as a result of their inability to recall further details, in December of 1963, Webb enlisted the assistance of Dr. Benjamin Simon, a psychotherapist in Boston, who served as the chief of neuropsychiatry and executive officer at Mason General Hospital, the Army's chief psychiatric center in World War II. Dr. Simon utilized hypnosis to aid in the couple's recollections of the event. Although the couple sought no publicity for nearly four years throughout the process, the media in Boston somehow picked up on the story, which would evolve into the seminal alien abduction story of Betty and Barney Hill, of course. It was during this transitional period in 1965 that Fuller alleges that a message was left for him at the Exeter police station where he based his investigation. The message was left by Betty Hill requesting assistance with their case. I must admit that this is a bit perplexing given Fuller's self-professed lack of knowledge of the subject and the fact that his first articles on the subject of UFOs and book Incident at Exeter were not published until 1966. Furthermore, is that it is also curious that Fuller claimed to have been conducting research in Exeter in the summer of 1965 when the incident, which is the central focus of his book, did not occur until September 3rd of that year. Be that as it may, upon the conclusion of Webb's investigation, he issued a final report on August 30th, 1965, which included Dr. Simon's assessment regarding their hypnosis session. Webb wrote, Dr. Simon is convinced the first UFO encounter actually took place as reported, and that a craft of some sort was witnessed by Mr. and Mrs. Hill. The Boston psychiatrist prefers to accept an Earth-based aircraft of either conventional or classified type rather than an extraterrestrial spacecraft. He further stated, I was of the opinion the Hills were telling the truth and that the first encounter with the UFO occurred exactly as reported, for minor uncertainties and technicalities that must be tolerated in any such observation where human judgment is involved. However, their affirming conclusion stopped short concerning the information subsequently obtained under hypnosis, instead concluding, Regarding the second encounter, the abduction story, Simon believes it happened only in Betty Hill's dreams, and that Barney at first was skeptical and believed they were just dreams. But gradually, Barney's suggestibility took hold, and he, like his wife, finally accepted the dreams as a manifestation of a real experience. Fuller was contracted by the Hills to document their story in his book, The Interrupted Journey, which in large part introduced the public to the concepts of alien abduction and missing time, despite Simon's protests that his conclusions were grossly misrepresented in the book and many related publications. Be that as it may, the entire situation seemingly was seemingly quite fortuitous for Fuller, who managed to produce two influential books on the subject of UFOs from incidents that occurred in a relatively confined area. Shortly after the publication of The Interrupted Journey in 1966, Fuller was conducting a town hall lecture on the Hill case when a skeptical audience member asked if he was sure the Hills weren't taking LSD. Fuller claimed this sparked a memory related to his discussion with Dr. Osis and the strange poisoning incident at Pont Saint-Esprit. He suddenly remembered that in the conversation it was mentioned that ergot fungus, as it was speculated, may have been responsible for the poisoning, was also used in the production of LSD. Although it had, been, it had been 15 years since the incident had occurred, Fuller decided to travel to France to conduct an investigation. Shortly after arriving in Pont Saint-Esprit, and presumably due to his newly obtained notoriety on the subject of UFOs, Fuller was informed that six months earlier, three well-respected members of the community separately reported witnessing an object which swung down silently from the sky 
and hovered not more than five or six feet above a field and then shot off into the sky at an incredible speed. Fuller went on to publish a book titled The Day of St. Anthony's Fire, in which he ultimately concluded that although the effects were initially attributed to flour having been contaminated by an organic mercury fungicide, there were traces of ergot alkaloids discovered in far more samples than contained mercury. The problem was that hardly anyone outside the Swiss laboratories knew anything about the then rare and strange form of ergot, which was so dramatically powerful and concentrated that it was hard to conceive. But as one doctor expressed his opinion, there is one and only one cause of the tragedy, some form of ergot, or is it ergo? Maybe it's ergo. It's ergot. Ergot. And that form has logically got to be akin to LSD. It is quite synchronistic that the Pont Saint Saint Esprit incident occurred at essentially the same time as Gottlieb was studying how fungi, of which ergot is a species, metabolized in the skeletal portion of plant cells, and shortly before his promotion to the head of TSS chem- of the TSS chemical branch. So, in light of all this obscure history, by now you are probably asking yourself, what is the relevance of all of this to the subject of UFOs? <laughs> <laughs> Potentially a great deal, but for now, let us consider the following. In 1953, Gottlieb expanded provisions of MK Ultra Subproject 4 under Subproject 15 to include an allowance for travel for Mr. Mulholland and for operational supplies used in the course of this project. Gottlieb explained that certain proportions of Subproject 4 require experimental verification by Mr. Mulholland. The item for operational supplies is intended to to provide for the purchase of supplies used to test or verify ideas. Mulholland's responsibilities within the agency were soon expanded under Subproject 19 in connection with an investigation of claims in the general field of parapsychology, which was directly related to Paharek's claims regarding telepathy. Arborelli notes that at that point, Mulholland's travel and interest in parapsychology increased significantly, He emphasizes that in communications with Gottlieb and Lashbrook, Mulholland began began making frequent references to the girls and the women. According to Mulholland's biographer Ben Robinson, these individuals were actually several young women that Mulholland had recruited through his secretary mistress Dorothy Wolfe. He recruited them not only for psychic tests, but also to secretly dose CIA-targeted individuals with LSD and other drugs. Furthermore, the targeted individuals were located in Maine, New Hampshire, Illinois, and Connecticut, as well as other states. Perhaps for regular followers of the series, a refresher is in order. In Brothers of the Serpent, episode number 238, Revelations, we discussed how in April 1954, a housewife named Dorothy Martin, living in Oak Park, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago where Mulholland frequented, began receiving strange messages from Sananda, alerting her to an imminent cataclysm and a mass UFO landing. In Brothers of the Serpent episode number 214, A History of Unlikely Coincidences, part 2, we discussed how in May of 1954, a housewife housewife named Frances Swan, the next-door neighbor of Rear Admiral Herbert Knowles, soon to be director of NICAP, living in Elliott, uh, 133 miles from Puharek's Round Table Foundation in Glen Cove, is this, what is this? Maine. Maine, began receiving strange, mes- strange messages from Afa and Ponar, re- alerting her to an imminent cataclysm and a mass UFO landing. Furthermore, she also attended a meeting with seven CIA officials in Washington, D.C. for questioning. By 1956, Mulholland's responsibilities were refocused on the application of the magician's art to the covert communication of information. This would involve the application of techniques and principles employed by magicians, mind readers, etc. to communicate information and the development of new techniques. The objective, to make Mr. Mulholland available as a consultant on various problems, TSS and otherwise, as they evolve. These problems concern the application of the magician's technique to clandestine operations. Such techniques to include surreptitious delivery of materials, deceptive movements and actions to cover normally prohibited activities, influencing choices and perception of other persons, various forms of disguise, 
and covert signaling systems, etc. As a result, Mulholland was then sent to, sent to Hopkinsville, Kentucky, to investigate the Sutton Farmhouse alien invasion. Then, in the spring of 1959, MK Ultra Sub Project 83 was established to revise and adapt some of the material that Mulholland had developed on deception techniques, magic, sleight of hand, and signals, and on psychic phenomena. Soon after, in September 1961, Betty and Barney Hill claimed to have been abducted by aliens near Lancaster, New Hampshire, 150 miles from Puharek's Round Table Foundation in Glen Cove. And in the summer of 1965, Fuller began investigating the incident at Exeter, which occurred in September of that year, 146 miles from Puharek's Round Table Foundation. Given all the coincidences and connections between the in- individuals involved and their proximity to targeted areas described by, by Mulholland, I will allow the listeners to draw their own conclusions. But this spooky story is far from over. Until next time, we leave you with this final quote. What we are dealing with is a vast and half-lit area where nothing seems believable, but everything is possible. Carl Gustav Jung. (laughs) Wow. So, I mean, it seems like you can't, like, how do you weed out the, the actual sightings, real encounters versus just like some weird CIA shit where they're drugging people or drugging the next door neighbor next that, to somebody who's about right. to be involved in some government program to yeah. go look at stuff. It's like, what is going on? <laughs> the government programs are tricking their own guys that are supposed to be looking into it. I mean, I, I don't know. That's That was the point I was trying to make. That notice that they're taking both sides yeah they're both they're both discrediting sightings and creating sightings yeah they're and cre- saying that ufos don't exist while they at the same time say the government is hiding evidence of aliens mm-hmm. they're playing both sides of the fence they're trying their information overload they're distorting the picture they're yeah. making it impossible to tell which way is up to discern which ones are real and which ones are exactly yeah yeah so not, I mean, I you've got, you've already gonna, got, you're already going to have enough fake ones just without messing with anything. Right. There's always the, the, you know, uh, misidentifications and things like that. But notice that also by controlling the narrative, you get to, you get to promote the aspects that you want people to believe. And you also get to suppress the things you don't want them to, to, just look at what Mulholland said. They, they, that the magician's art is to introduce all this, you know, extraneous, yeah, misdirection. Yeah. Right. Adding to add, lead you yeah. down wrong paths and things. Yeah. That's why I'm saying you've got to look at this in the big picture of things. That's so, where looking at the, the, the patterns, right. That I, I'm always emphasizing these patterns. When you start looking at the patterns, well, these sorts of manipulations become a little less significant. If you see that, well, this certain pattern existed before yeah. these organizations were doing this. Now you know, okay, well, these are maybe areas of potential, m- potentially more significant rather than things that could be dead ends. Yeah. Yeah, I it's agree. Not to, yeah, I, it's not to suggest that the banana is not real. I know some people are going to go, oh, he's just, you know, he's. Yeah, he's suggesting it's all drugs. People. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, it's, if you're going to really understand this, you cannot leave this aspect out. In other words, a certain percentage of these things are pur- purposeful deceptions. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities, but it's it's weird. And, and maybe I misunderstood this last part, but there's this person that they possibly gave LSD to. The guy likes to experiment with like giving people drugs that when they're not... They don't even know it. And then they're the next door neighbor to a guy who's involved in NICAP in like studying (laughs) stuff. So somebody else is like, hey, that's where that person lives. Let me like try to create an encounter 
and then see if this guy will <laughs> end up studying it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is there that may be different factions within the government and, and maybe the, they're at odds. Maybe they try to confuse each other. I don't know, but definitely well, the, the, <clears throat> the uh, infiltration of NICAP. Yeah. And I don't even know if you could say infiltration. It almost would seem as though it was created in, but to some degree, it almost as though it was created by the intelligence agencies. Yeah. And they, they don't what necessarily, I, I, for sure, they don't, share all of their information across these these agencies there's like you know there is a somewhat of a rivalry there as far as i know or at least i've heard yeah yeah i, I, I mean you the only way uh, again to, the only way to begin to have any chance at deciphering this mystery is is not to leave out relevant data right this this is an important facet of a very complex picture i keep emphasizing that this is a multi-layer cake right there's all these things happening simultaneous to each other i think that again just like mohan said some of it is is distraction uh, and i've said this many times if somebody's pointing to the sky and saying look 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 at that thing flying up there in the air. Maybe you need to be looking around you or looking at your back pot. What is, why are they trying to get your attention up there? What is, what is it that they're trying to distract you from? Whenever they're agreeing with you, when the, these agencies, these deceptive agencies are telling, are, are the ones saying, oh yeah, this thing's really real and they're hiding it. Why are they saying that? What is their, motivation here why why are they playing both sides that's machiavellian okay, tactics gotcha. yeah <clears throat> maybe they're scared of what they've found you possibly know? i think maybe at this period maybe in, in you know we're talking most of this was taking place in the 50s yeah it's possible that they didn't really know what they were dealing. I mean, they it's may possible, still yeah. not know what they're dealing with, yeah. right? This could be a mystery that's unsolvable. Have you? And they've maybe, got clues, you know. Maybe, yeah. maybe there's a faction that's like Inky, and the Wall. You know, like, like we there's a directive, and you're not allowed to tell them what's actually going on. So you create fake ones, and then you're like, "Wow, look at look." Yeah. Because you can say, well, those aren't real. Yeah. So I haven't broken the directive. I'm just getting the public to look at these fake ones. Yeah. Right. And there, and you know, and you that that raises another point is that it's not like there's it's not a three body problem. It's not like there's the public, the phenomenon, and the and the and government the intelligence agencies. Yeah. There could be factions within not only within the government, but there could be factions within the phenomenon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Like, um, let me bring this back around to science fiction. Have you, Marty, have you ever read any Warhammer stuff? No. Some of this research. starts to remind me of that. That uh, once, basically, the Warhammer is really complicated, but the part that I'm talking about is uh, is that once any advanced race gets to a certain level of technological advancement, they discover that there is a way to uh, build powerful machines and travel through space, but it requires them going into a realm filled with spiritual entities that are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and they inevitably become corrupted by their interactions with this realm. The warp is what they call it. And so that that it's really it's you know it's fiction obviously but it creates this interesting idea that first of all this 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 has an answer to the Fermi paradox that once you get to a certain advancement you discover this realm you start using it because you, it allows you to travel through space and then it destroys you because it's full of very evil dark entities right uh, and it also can interact with our realm and it wants to it's like it's basically demons okay you know that's the idea and some of them are really powerful. So it's like a combination. You have a combination of both things. Like there are actual 
possibly out there like alien physical alien uh, civilizations. But in order for them to get here, they have to interact with this demonic realm. So by the time they get here, they're already partially corrupted, and they are also bringing with them the phenomena of the demonic realm. And some of their manifestations look like demons, and there are demons involved. So then our government starts looking into this and finds both things, right? Demons and aliens. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they're inextricably connected. They're, you can't disconnect them because the interaction is required. The other thing it's just about, an interesting the, idea yeah, in fiction. The, no, yeah. the, I, I, the connection I thought you were going to go down was, you kind of did, but they have like these government agents and their job is to like get rid of the evil stuff, right? Yeah. You yeah. Know, they're supposed to be like a police force sort of. But... The Inquisition. Yeah. Yeah. They so they go around and they're trying to find these like demonic and messed up, you know, bad forces and destroy them. And a lot of times they start out not believing in any of the really dark, you know, That's demonic right. stuff. And then as they start to get further and further in to some deep um uh, corrupt system, they start finding that type of stuff going on, these interesting phenomena and demonic stuff that they all thought was not even real. Yep. And the only way to fight it is to use the same forces. Yeah. And so they get corrupted. So they slowly <laughs> get corrupted while they're fighting against it. Yeah. And it reminds me of these guys. Yeah. Like, okay, dudes, <laughs> let's go out in the desert and start drawing pentagrams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. A, that's what I'm saying. The, the, the the slightest bit of interaction with this kind of thing inevitably results in corruption of the of the individuals interacting with it you know and in warhammer it's interesting because they start out with a completely secular atheistic society they don't believe in any gods they don't know spiritual stuff or whatever and then as time goes and then they they interact with the warp more the warp gets involved in them and corrupts everything and then they become this massively like uh, authoritarian religious civilization that's terrified of all things involved that they're still using it. It's like, it, you know, it goes back and forth. Both civilizations fail against th- this power is the point. You can't win. It's, it is a great filter. It's inevitably destructive. So it just seems like, you know, I know we're bringing this crazy fiction in into your whole thing here, but I'm just, no, t- yeah. I think, I think that that is entirely possible. No, even the most far-fetched theory yeah. really stands on equal ground. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't. We really don't know. And and the reality may be something that is actually be, beyond our ability to comprehend. Yeah. It, may, it yeah. may be something that we have no terms for. It could. And we're just, I. I don't. I don't really take anything off the table. There right. are things that I would say are less likely, you know, the, the you know, we've had conversations about, you know, the, the, the ETH, you know, the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And, yeah. and as you know, I'm, I'm not completely on board with the idea that they're traveling here by means like physical means in terms of getting on a spaceship and flying or, you know, literally moving, traveling, like not jumping, but traveling, there are a lot of problems with that, that, you know, what are the odds that all these different civilizations are, are all following the same, you know, prime directive that they don't, they all interact with us the same way. And they all tend to follow the same patterns and they, they can breathe our air and they're impervious to our diseases and germs. And or is there's, I mean, I'm not going to say it's not impossible, but it doesn't seem very likely it seems yeah. like maybe there's a something else maybe there's something we're missing maybe these are just different manifestations of one thing right yeah and it doesn't mean don't, don't get me wrong that doesn't mean there isn't extraterrestrial life they're very well not very well there is right yeah. I, mean, I think at this point everybody is like, yes there is but if they're interacting with us i don't think they're interacting with us is uh like slight evolution of what we know, right? We think, okay, we're building rockets. We're going to build a little bit faster rockets. And then we're going to be able to like, odds are they're so far past that. We're, we're just, 
we're thinking of this evolutionary process instead of a completely revolutionary process. I think that there will be a breakthrough that's going to go, can you believe we wasted all that time on that? And was that, that dead end yeah. when there was this other way that was so much easier that nobody ever thought of, or maybe people thought of it a long time ago and discounted it or suppressed it, or th there are a million different ways we could cut this. But I think fundamentally, I think where I'm trying to go with this particular episode and, and this is, this one's kind of isolated. It's not, it, it, it follows the previous one, but we're going to shift gears when, as we a little bit as we go forward in this. I just we needed to make this point. I needed this to be in the back of the listener's mind when they're listening to all the things we're going to be talking about in the future. But I think I look at this kind of like the Kobayashi Maru. Are you familiar with the Kobayashi yeah. Maru? Yeah. That... Okay. Nope. For for <laughs> people who may not know this, and I'm not a a trekkie yeah, right but yeah I'm it's basically aware of it's a concept. test you can't win right this is uh, right yeah when when captain <laughs> was mad. Was, <laughs> right he's mad <laughs> oh, no. i don't know <laughs> he knows he knows what it is <laughs> yeah of course oh <laughs> when uh when captain the only way kirk to win is, is in, to cheat yeah. yeah right when captain kirk is in star uh, start fleet command or whatever he's to you know he's got to take his test to become a star fleet commander they he has to take this test that all all you know uh Everyone fails. To take. Yeah. Right. And it's really a psychological test. It's yeah. not a win or lose. It's a, it's an unwinnable situation. You have to, the idea is that the Kobayashi Maru is under attack. And if you don't save them, they're all going to die. And if you try to save them, you're going to die. And it's, so it's basically yeah. a no win situation. Yeah. And it's just to test the way that, that, you know, potential candidate processes things. Right. And how he handles Her, big time right. failure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Kirk recognizes that this is an unwinnable situation. So instead of playing the game, he hacks the computer and cheats. Yeah. He gets outside the game and beats the He's the only one that ever did. And everybody was furious. Oh, he cheated and everything. They're like, no, he figured out a way out of the game. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. If we can figure out what's going on in terms of the game, maybe we can figure out how to get outside the game and Use a different perspective. You're gonna get us killed, Marty. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Hey, don't, don't don't think that I, those that didn't occur to me. Is I'm writing all this stuff about all these intelligence agencies. You know, if all these are all none of know, us are suicidal, folks. <laughs> yeah, it is not happening. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there there were a lot of points where I'm like, mm, maybe I shouldn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's great. I mean, I you you've put together a fantastic body of material here and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes, but I really do I mean, it's all it's it seems inextricably tied to all this paranormal stuff, you know, and like why, you know, it, another thing that I always remember is Bosley, you know. We talked to Bosley and he's like, "Oh yeah, all the guys at the tops of these intelligence agencies yeah, are sorry. interested in this stuff." And we're yeah. like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, that was, we're that like, was "What?" Really, wow. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> See, but that 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 raises a question. I mean, even without him saying that, just observing everything that's going on in the media today, knowing the things that were going on even before that, yeah. and then looking at this historical stuff, you're like, why is this thing just completely permeated with intelligence agents? Yeah. What? You know, look at it like this. If the phenomenon isn't real, why have they gone to so much effort and spent so much money on something that doesn't exist? Yeah. That's that's why I love this aspect of it. Yeah. Like this so I know you're you're like you have this big holistic view and your thing is like, well we have to consider all of the all of the stuff. Like you're a, you're a great generalist on on a subject, but you also need not you specifically, but the subject also needs the specialists that, that are like looking at minuscule aspects of it and really like deep diving in that to figure it yeah. out, right? Because right. just like physics or something, you know, any science, like you can have all of the universe to try to figure out how it all yeah, works. Yeah, you can have a cosmologist or you can have a guy that sits there and looks at 1 over 137 yeah, for his you, entire life. But you need trying to figure you out need why other exists. guys that are all digging into their own little special 
aspect of it and and making discoveries that the generalists would never have noticed. And you start well, gathering all that. I'm so that's kind of like, like what you're doing. You're, the you're analyst, like, like the data analyst. In other words, I'm not out there in the field collecting the research and, you know, doing the, the on boots on the ground investigation stuff. The problem with that is I did spend a good part of my life doing that. And I eventually figured out that it's a road to nowhere. Life's not long enough. <laughs> well, not just that, but there, there's no case that is beyond dispute. In other words, no matter what, there's yeah. no amount of evidence will be enough to convince a diehard skeptic. Just like there are people on the, you know, UFO side that every light in the sky is a UFO and yeah. you can't convince them otherwise. And yeah. they don't want to listen. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't use Twitter much. Uh, you know, every once in a while I'll post something, but you know, one day somebody posted something, some, another podcast posted something about the green fireball phenomenon during in the fifties. And I said, well, you know, it, that was, this test of the boron fuels that they were testing on B2s. The guy went off. He's like, Oh, like I didn't do my research. And I'm like, dude, I'm not trying to argue with this. this is like, it's not hard. I can understand that at the time when La Paz was investigating everything, there were things he could not say publicly, right? He's work. He's doing a research program on behalf of the government. He's not going to out the people that are paying his, yeah. know, signing his check. Right. But at the same time, there was probably a lot of data that he was not privy to. But, in you know, in the subsequent 50, 60 years, stuff has surfaced. And now we do know that they were studying this, this you know, this boron fuel that burns green, which makes sense. And you're in New Mexico, you're seeing green fireballs in the sky. I mean, like two and two together. It's not hard. <laughs> and the guy freaking went off on me, you. blocked you me the whole night. Him yeah, so hard. exactly. I'm like, dude, and I told, I go, you don't understand. We're on the same side. I'm trying to help you, not, not waste your time. Try to build an argument on something yeah. that's a dead end. You're, you're not helping yourself. You're hurting yourself because you're gonna do. When somebody shows you this, you it discredits you, and then the, every that reflects on everything else you do, right? Yeah. So, it's a very difficult position to be in, to try to be objective. And I, and I know we, none of us are, can be, we're, there's no way to be completely objective, but you can at least try. You can try. And yeah. don't avert your eyes to things that the data is there. You just don't want to look at. I'm still getting nailed to the wall for scurping you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are still talking shit to Kyle <laughs> for like getting upset that you were telling us stories about people drawing weird <laughs> triangles in the desert. Why are you telling us about people doing drugs in the desert right now? <laughs> I was here. I'm here for UFOs, Marty. This, yeah, this is the skirt, the skirt episode. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> you deserved it. <laughs> now this is great. Yeah, it's it's so, really good. So we got another part to this. Oh yeah, we got several more for this. Yeah. Just for this spookiest story okay, never for told. The spookiest story has several more parts coming. Yeah. Are they how soon? Are we I'm getting... gonna give them a little bit of time to digest this one because nah. there was a lot. <laughs> But the other, the next they have ones are all of the done. future to digest it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. The next one is pretty much pretty close to done and it definitely shifts gears. It picks up certain aspects of things that we touched on in this one, but it'll definitely shift gears into maybe some of the substrata of the things that were on the surface in this one. <laughs> well, let us know there when it's done. Let's little, do it. There's always little things hidden in there that yeah somebody will pick up on a certain sentence that i wrote that was you know it's easier when you're reading it in text because i'll like for for us i'll underline things like mm, yeah this is he important. underlines stuff <laughs> i get clues yeah Let's he gets get little clues. clues yeah and when it's underlined and bold and blue i know it's very yeah. important <laughs> yeah, yeah well, like, you need to like that that sentence about uh the one that uh, brewer wrote about about NICAP and he says mode the motives and objectives might be more complex than those that hinged on stated opinions about UFOs. Yeah, exactly. He's he's saying the same thing. He's saying, look, they're taking both sides of the issue. What if they're doing that? Why? What is it? What are they doing? Why would they take both sides of this issue? Yeah. Are these, There's some other are you purpose. To, are to these that. the same people taking yeah, both the sides? Yeah, the same people. Yeah. The same people. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, the the guy, the guy that's 
heading the CIA that is involved in the decision to discredit sightings and to to uh, you know uh, I guess uh, I wouldn't say but I mean the the suggestion is infiltrate these UFO groups yeah retire immediately retires and starts a UFO group. starts like, a UFO group yeah yeah I mean in words that there's something else going on there. mm. there's something more it's I'm not saying that they're necessarily lying but but another trying an, to distract you from something else another i don't thing, know what that is but another thing to consider is that in these government programs the the bureaucracy a lot of times the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing i mean this is that's the nature of it so i mean even in really mundane things you have bureau uh, bureaucracies basically working against itself and then, yeah. you, it, you know, it's like, well, there's a big problem, but nobody realizes it because nobody, even the people at the top can't really see and analyze everything that's taking place within this organization. So that's a possibility also. Oh, I'm sure that's a factor. But, you know, and then the other thing is like the the fact that we're hearing about these whistleblowers now and then they're acting as though that's never happened before. Oh, you know, this yeah, yeah that's- very, they're very important and they're like, how much more important could you be than the freaking director of the CIA is saying the the Air Force is lying to you? But you're right. You know it's, what I mean? It's and like we need congressional hearings. It's like a cycle. And, it's going around yeah. and around. Like they're, they're coming back around. All right, let's have some whistleblowers. Let's have a New York Times article. You know, let's get everybody like riled up about this again. We're you know, and maybe maybe like you said, maybe it's a big distraction. It's all it's it's all part of the you know they. It's all part of this like magician's uh, sleight of hand, misdirection. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The it, you know, and that that was Hill and Cotter in 1960. Yeah, and then you know, as I've mentioned before, uh, more than once, that that there were the there was the the Life article, have we visitors from space, and the Saturday yep. Evening Post articles and all that, and they we find out that those were all actually. They selected the 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 uh, the journalists the, uh, the journalists to to publish these articles. Yeah. The, the Air Force or was the one that was seeding the information to them for them to go public and say that the government was lying to. Them. In other words, why are they they're purposely stirring the pot? Okay, well let's before we, we before we close out here because we've gone really long. This has been fantastic, <laughs> but like last question for people who are interested in this subject right now, in your opinion. Who are some people that they might listen to that you think are like closer to the truth on this subject or people who are more trustworthy than others? Like maybe they're not, they're doing misdirection, but they're actually doing real research. Like, can you give a name or two? There are, I mean, yeah. And, and, and the other thing is you can, you, you know, it's the guy that's trying to save the world, you know, yeah. thing again, where, yeah. You can have good intentions, but do things that ultimately, you know, you let's say you're convinced because you've been fed documents or anything that, oh, yeah. this, you know, I'm got I'm privy to this exclusive information and you're assured this is true. So you're now you're the guy that's going to go public and look, you know, I've discovered this and you may not even realize that you're the Pied Piper. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're leading everybody down a path that was purposely fed to you to to draw people off the, yeah the, absolutely, the real absolutely scent, right yeah, yeah so that's a big factor so i'm hesitant especially after like this episode the information in this episode i'm hesitant to say anything because then sure enough that person gets dr- <laughs> right. you know like yeah. like for example i mean i will say this like valet for example yeah valet is you know got a great track record in terms of his uh view and his you know his perspective on on the situation right he makes great observations but it's also you can't overlook the his connections to the intelligence sure. community and SRI yep. and all I that. yep. that's a factor it's got it's got a factor in and 
I assure you, he knows a lot more than he's saying. And Alex, we need your resume. We need to get <laughs> yeah. your resume. Who, who are you connected to, Marty? <laughs> I want to know where you. I been also, working. I also know, like, and I want to tell everybody this, and I'll put the link in the show notes. But Marty did an episode with Alex on Skeptico recently that was really good. I recommend anyone who's interested in Marty's thoughts and work go listen to that. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but Alex made a good point that, and you also, you guys talked about it a little bit that you know that that. Uh, Valet's the things that he says when he goes on an uh, on a podcast or something like when he gets interviewed versus what you read in his books sometimes seem very different. And I agree with you. It's like he's much more careful when he's talking than he is when he's writing. It seems like. Yeah, he's de there's a definite disconnect. There. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know why that is. Yeah, I don't either. I've noticed you know, the same thing. Yeah. Even like when he was on Rogan, you know, I was expecting Rogan would ask him questions, and I'm like, oh, here it comes, you know, some bit of you know yeah revelatory Valetus. information and yeah. then all of a sudden it's like nothing yeah you're like why didn't he say this why didn't he say stuff that we know stuff you know, that we know he said slowly, before yeah slowly me knows and he you know here's <laughs> yeah the godfather of ufology and he's not you know he's got the gun holstered and yeah he's not he just doesn't bring these things up that you know good and well he has the ability to yeah. present a tremendous amount of not just anecdotes but data yeah. right he's been collecting data yeah and, you know and god there's there there's so many moving parts right now you know i haven't been very active in the discord lately not only because i've been working on this series because there's a lot more to the come there's this is just a tiny fraction of a ton of other things but there's so much going on right now that i'm really hesitant to comment on it because i want the dust to settle a little yep. bit yep I agree. Yeah. You know, the more you can, especially when you start seeing that, look, look how manipulative, to, mani manipulative these organizations can be. And, and that muddying of the waters is definitely a, a it's the go-to, right? That's the first thing they do. Is yeah. It's on if purpose. There's, if there's a bit of legitimate information, you know, that thing's going to get buried by, Oh, you know, there was aliens in the backyard of this guy's house and this, and that gets all the publicity and then distracts from something that by comparison seems mundane, but by itself is probably pretty important, Yeah, but it gets <clears throat> lost in the shelf. And that definitely happens a lot. Yeah. So we live wow. in interesting times. I will say that. <laughs> I, I guess everybody always says that, but this there's there seems to be more more activity in this realm than ever. I would say, I, yeah. I, you know, I I wasn't around in the early '50s when this was going, but I'd, I'd say that this has to be up there, if not more more uh, in your face in terms of bombarded with information, just constant information every day. There's multiple new aspects of the phenomena that are coming to light and you have to wonder what where, which what of all of this deserves more you know investigation yeah and that's why like i said i'm really hesitant to put my chips on anyone yeah yeah i wasn't meaning for you to put your chips yeah. on me i would like maybe a better way to ask the question is like who like who would you who are you listening to whether you think that they're telling the truth or not who are you paying attention to you know, like if you see an ep an episode comes out with somebody being interviewed, you're like, okay, I'm going to listen to that one. Uh, Kevin Knuth is very, very, I think he's in order a hundred percent data guy, right? Okay. He's doing these things. And, um, you I mean, that was not the question I was expecting. So <laughs> I'm a little bit on the spot and I'm hesitant because again, they're the names that most people might be familiar with are the ones that, oh man, I don't, I don't know, you know? Richard Dolan is definitely, he's been around a long time and he's very, very knowledgeable, <coughs> very, very a good historian for ufology. But it doesn't mean that he hasn't been influenced with yeah. data. I think he's pretty <clears throat> objective, but I'm sure that if you're, when you're in that position and we act, this is something we actually talked about before we started recording the show. Then I said, I don't want that kind of attention. Sure. Because I think as soon as you're on the radar, that's when you're yeah. now the target. You start getting right? fed now. stuff. Yep. yep. Yeah. And I don't, I, I'd rather find it myself. I don't really want things coming to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I know the, 
the sense that I'm trying to follow and I don't need distractions. Half the time, you know, people are posting videos and things like that. And I don't want that influence. I don't want it to, as even though it might be useful information, I'm afraid that it's going to muddy the water for me and it's going to maybe distract me from something that I'm already kind of like in a certain direction. And maybe that's a bias. I don't know, but I, I hope it's not. I try not to be biased, but we all have them. Yeah. Biases and it's inevitable. All right. Well, that's, that's a good answer. It's a good enough answer. You're like, I don't pay attention to anybody. That's basically what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. He's just reading, he's reading old books. And... That's what I was going to say. Give <laughs> us a good book. <laughs> I do like, I will admit that I like the perspective that Diana Pasolka is. Okay. I was, to I was thinking you might say Pasolka. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean that I, because she's could yeah, you're be not a endorsing of the same thing. Yeah, right. you're not endorsing was, everything she says. You're just paying attention, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's I think what I mean. that she's on the right track. I think that we're both chasing maybe somewhat of the same. Yeah. Thing. Um. I don't know for sure, but there, there's. I mean, there's a little bit of a. Maybe th- we could, maybe weird. we could get her it, on the show. That would be fantastic. Yeah, she's got a new book coming out in November, so that would be it's possible. Awesome. Yeah. But one thing, one connection, just very briefly, because it's something to think about. You know, we mentioned, I mentioned valet, and now I'm mentioning Pasolka. And the, 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 there's an intersect there that's kind of interesting. That now um, the book Trinity has been called into question because now there's all this information coming out, you know, claiming to be able to prove that that whole story was a fabrication. <laughs> and they're they're putting out a lot of really, I mean, damning damning information that really does call into question whether there's any validity, any validity to, that to the case. story at all. Okay. Yes, but and how that affects Dana Pasolka is indirect because in the book, in her, in American Cosmic, she's taken by Timothy Taylor to the, the gifting field, the gifting which field. was the Trinity press yeah. site. So if, and, and that's kind of the central premise or that's where the whole book is kind of founded on that. Everything Mm. goes from there. So if Trinity didn't happen, then how much of that that's in that book is real. Yeah. And was this an orchestrated thing? Like is Taylor an agent that's feeding disinformation to Pasolka and now is this this grand conspiracy or is it just now the conspiracy is this discrediting side in order to get into yeah. this really touchy situation where again, I'm going to sit back and just let the dust settle. <laughs> <laughs> in it's other too, words, it's too you're going to get to that later. Yeah. We're going to get to that later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I see that this is your own strategy for yourself. I'll get to that later. later. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Don't commit. <laughs> you got to hold yourself to the same Can't standard. Can't be wrong. If you don't have forcing us to go down. <laughs> All right, thanks, Marty. Yeah, man, that was great. Yep. Let us know when the next part's ready. Yep. What do we got Very for soon. what do we got for producers? You got ah, producers? Yes. I uh, probably have some too. Let's I gotta uh, look it up. We got it. We gotta I give these people pulled up. Gotta give these people their props. They deserve it. Oh, this goes back to the Cosmic Summit. Charles Mills, executive producer for this show. Thank you, buddy. Hundred bucks. Plus, he bought two hats. No. Oh. oh, no, wait. He only bought one hat. No. So he gave us, he gave us 125 bucks. Thanks, buddy. Wow. Really appreciate that. Executive producer of this show, which is 291. We're almost at 300. What are we going to do? <laughs> For 300? Nothing. We're gonna skip it. We'll write we'll, a song. We'll do. We'll do something for four hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Marty's gonna have to come out here. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, how do I do this? I'm trying to. Remember. Laura's been brushing up on her, on the UFO episodes. Yep. Yep. And I'll also just thank uh, Contessa again, and and Travis. I think his name is for, uh, for the delicious blueberry beers. The. Uh, Sweetwater. 
They're really good. Laura likes them too. And this was the last one. I appreciate that. All right, here we go. Sorry that took me so long. Oh, our list is uh, has increased here. So, f- Patreon executive producers, we have Philip Baklamov, Matt Shy, Peter Shell, and Zachariah Baker. Wow. And then uh, for the Patreon associate executive producers, we have Captain River Rat, uh, Chris James. Hey. Hey. hey thank you, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> Daniel Gandy, who's been with us a long time as well. Dave Cortez and Patrick Hicks, the patron saint. Oh, the patron saint. And the patron saint has returned. Thank so, you yeah, so thank much. you guys all so much for supporting the show and everybody else who supports it uh, by listening, by giving us your talent, like our buddy buddy Troy who has been yes, doing fantastic absolutely. artwork for us and posters and stickers and just time talent and treasure from everyone thank you guys so much and thank you for supporting the show and thank you Marty again your your research is excellent <laughs> it's always great to have you on uh, Thanks. Looking, yeah looking forward to the next part and we're gonna ha- we need to hang out in Vegas buddy we need to go party in Vegas gonna happen yeah soon very yeah. soon hope so <laughs> all right good night everybody we love you guys always have always will Get back to work. <laughs> you missed it. Good night, Adama. You, good night, Adama. I knew my part. You just didn't say yours. <laughs> what? You're supposed to say good night, I was Adama. waiting for you to say good night, and I was going to say. I didn't want to point at you. <laughs> I was no, pointing at me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Watcher. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marty. Watcher. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Good night, good night everybody. everybody.